I'm trying to. Add, I'm, I'm trying. By the way, three, two, one, wrong. Oh. I'm, I'm, tr- I'm <laughs> trying to uh, get my knowledge base wide. Mm-hmm. I, I I've said it on a couple of episodes. I admire Joe Rogan. Of I course. really do. Oh yeah. I don't admire him because of his. You know the the. Cur- he doesn't have any more <laughs> treats. Come here, Kenji. I know you like you. you come here, Kenj. Number three on the podcast. Come on, man. Hey. Sorry, buddy. Kenji. I'm, I'm friendly. Kenji. <laughs> Get over here. Get over here with your fat head. I don't Get know. Get over here. I guess that means he likes me. Yeah, he likes you. No, no, you know. <laughs> Trust yeah. me. He'd, he'd get really rigid and he'd be really not friendly looking. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I don't admire him because of like the amount of money that he makes. Because, I mean, listen, that's an admirable take. Everybody mm-hmm. feels like that's the end all be all. And I've been guilty of it for a long time as well. Of so course. we could talk about that because that was kind of like the last, <laughs> the last question as well. But- I admire him because he knows so much about so many different topics. Yes. And it's really crazy when you start to talk to him about something where you go, oh, wow, this guy's about to really give him some breakdown and knowledge. Oh, yeah. And And, and Joe's just like, oh, yeah, I read this book and I knew this and that. And you go, oh, wow. Like, he just knew it already. That's pretty cool. And not even just that, like controversy, too. Like, you know, he looked up so much stuff and it's for anyone's take, you know, no matter where you are. But like. I like Apple podcast. They took him down because of the whole thing with like the COVID vaccines and this and that, and the whole nine, you know, he signed this, you know, multi million. I don't even know. Maybe it was billion dollar deal with Spotify, but then a bunch. Yeah. So there you go. You know, but like Apple took him down. A couple other people took him down because they didn't like what he had to say. So, you know, it's like, he's a great dude. I mean, he's rich, but like, he's also leading in controversy he because just, people try to say what he can and can't say. You he know, just so. seems like the kind of guy that I strive to be, which is just a regular ass dude and just to have good conversations with good people and hang out and shoot my videos and chill with my dog, do jujitsu. And, you know, I just want to, I just want to have a good time. We're not on this earth for a long time. And the long, the, the older that I'm getting, the more, and the more I'm figuring it out that the simplicity of things is actually the better version oh, of yeah. things. And with more money does come more problems. It's weird how that kind of oh, works. Yeah, well, it's, it's, you think like, oh, yeah, this guy's got billions and he's got no headaches in the world. And you start to understand when you look from the from different perspectives and you go, oh, maybe it's not like that. It actually might not be that. Way. Well, he started in the UFC as like, you know, as a commentator and announcer and stuff like that. But then he just kind of developed himself as he went on. You ever watch his training videos? That dude kicks like a truck. Kicks like dude, Mack he, truck he, he's, he's like 50 something and he kicks harder than 20 and 30 year olds, you know. Dude, so, he is massive. So because I'm, I'm always with Sarah. <laughs> yeah. I'm always with Sarah yeah. at, at school. I was with him this morning and he was saying, I'm going back on Joe's podcast in a couple of weeks and this and that. How's the training going? It's good, man. Yeah. It's good. It feels good. I'm I'm still three stripe white belts. Yep. It's been um it's been a journey, man. The the ankle injury was tough. Yeah. That was that was really tough for me. You're talking to the king of injuries. <laughs> you know? The injury was tough because it took me out of the gym in general. It didn't just mm-hmm. take me out of the gym for jujitsu. Mm-hmm. So, you know, little nagging things like the jujitsu fingers yep. and the joint swelling and whatnot. Here, come, here comes the cauliflower ear. My ears, my, my, yep. dude, I was looking today and I'm losing that that. I'm, you know, when you look at an ear, you have all of the different pieces that you can see, mm-hmm. and it's thin here, and then you have a line here. Yep. I'm losing that, and it's all becoming like one shape on the inside of my ear. Very subtle. I'm, I'm no way saying that it's like. Of course, yeah, up, no. But it's becoming that like very smoothed out, and I keep touching my ears because you know it's different. Of course, your of ears. Course. They've been yeah. with this since day one. Yeah. You start feeling. Wake up. You look at yourself. You stare in the mirror, and you're like, you know, like when I was heavy into it, you know, when I was when I was younger. I mean. My ears, I guess, were still developing. I was 17, 18, whatever it was. But, like, I know sometimes some people at that age, Gordon Ryan, he started cauliflowering when he was young, too. I mean, he still is young. He's, like, 24, 25, whatever he is. But, like, when I was when I was training, you know, when I started Sarah's at 16, 17 in East Meadow when they had that joint on uh, Hempstead Turnpike, you know, like, I was rolling with all those guys. And I pretty much knew, like, if I, I would look at their ear, and especially in public now, like, when I'm walking around and stuff like that, it's like, you know, I just look around and I, I'll see someone with cauliflower ear and I'm like, man, I, I feel bad for the guy that messes with you, <laughs> you know, yeah, you, you know, yeah. and like that. Well, shake somebody like, let me see those ears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me look at those ears. I'm not sizing up your arms. I'm sizing yeah, up your ears. Yeah, exactly. You know, but that, you know, that's one of the, that's, you know, that kind of goes into, in one of the topics that I wanted to talk about is just kind of like being ready for real life. I feel like a lot of people, and it's not taken away from anything in strength training and conditioning, but like. A lot of people, they just go to the gym and then they just call it at that, yeah. you, you know, and it's like in weight training and conditioning is all and all that's important. But like there's a lot that happens in the world. You know, there are constantly people who are trying to attack others. There's a stabbing here. There's a shooting here. These two people got jumped, you know, like I've always kind of lived life by a mentality. I wouldn't say always, but like the military helped shape me kind of into this mentality of being ready for anything. 
And I'm not saying it's just like, you know, oh, well, you know, the world's out to get me and I'm just going to, I'm going to hurt everyone. You know, it's just like, it's all about just like being aware of your surroundings and knowing what's going on around you. And, you know, like a lot of what a lot of people don't understand, or maybe they do understand and they're just neglectful of it is like a lot of street fights end up on the ground. And I grew up doing karate and karate helped my basis of a kid of learning self-defense, learning importance of knowing how to defend yourself. But like, as I got older, I, I, I found the UFC and I was like, wow, like this is crazy. I'm not saying I want to go be a cage fighter, but like, you know, like, and now at the time, like world star was a thing and the bare knuckle fights. But then there was like a lot of like Kimbo slice uh, Kimbo, you know, but I was also watching like Valley Trudo in Brazil and, and all that stuff like that, that a lot of people don't really know about. And I'm like, you know, maybe I should be ready, you know, to, you know, to, to learn how to fight on the ground. And that same karate school, I'm definitely going to give them props via the American Black Belt Academy in Massapequa. They helped my foundation of martial arts and they do have an MMA program now. And it's great. They have an octagon full setup and everything and whatnot. But at the time they didn't. But at like 16, 17, I was like, you know what? Like, I want to get on the ground. I want to learn how to do this stuff. And that's when I joined Sarah's and, you know, and one day I walked into OG and I had the Sarah hoodie on and you were like, ah, oh, this yeah, guy, you know, yeah. the, the, the OG Sarah hoodie. So, you know, all those guys. And it's great to see, like, I have a couple of them on Facebook. Um, you know, Chris Frieda, prime example guy. I was a white belt with him. He's and he's a black belt now. You know, I talk to him every now and then I say, what's up? He's a good guy polar bear you know the, those guys Patton's army in the morning you know i used to roll with those guys a little bit and you know they probably don't remember me but i remember them um my, you know my joints remember them yeah exactly yeah 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 all the bicep cutters yeah. and, and 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 all that stuff so we were, doing, we were doing knee bars this morning and that is oh, oh you get into reaping and stuff like that yeah that stuff just <laughs> creeps me out it doesn't even matter if it's like uh, just a regular level competition level yeah they knee stuff i'm just going i just cringe and i go oh please go slow don't do this fast you know but like the thing is and it's not even when just it's not like a competition mindset, but again, it goes back to what I said before about being ready for anything. Like if you get into a fight on the street and you end up on your back, you know, the best offense you can have from being on your back is knowing how to take control of the other guy's legs. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, um, Mikey, you know, Mikey Musemi, you know, 120 pounds guy spins like a top, you know, like he, you know, you could be the smallest guy ever or just not really know how to fight in general. But like, if you can, if you're on your back and you know how to spin and take out the other guy's legs or position yourself to where you can get around them, you know, it, it prevents yourself from ground and pound and stuff like that. You know, just laying on your back and going like this isn't really going to do anything. You got to be able to move, yeah. you know? So, and I feel like that's the importance of jujitsu, the importance of even just karate or like Muay Thai, you know, like a lot of people, you know, when you just see street fights on the street, it's people just swinging for each other's faces. You kick someone's leg two or three times, they're going to go down like a tree, yeah. you know? And it's like, you know, if, if you know, I pray I never get into it, you know, in a fight because, you know, like, you know, uh, it's funny. We learn, and I feel like that's the majority. I don't mean to cut you off. But yeah. The, the, in martial the arts, majority of yep. is you learn all this stuff with the hopes that ever actually have to use it. Martial arts I makes you the most passive person ever. Yeah. It, I, it has, it, it really does. So I, I was a, I, I did Kung Fu when I was younger, uh -huh. like really young. I did Kung Fu when I was a brown belt. I was supposed to test for my black belt. Dude, I don't fucking remember any of that shit. I mean, maybe it's ingrained somewhere in there. God forbid it ever has to come out and you just, you at least remember how to throw a kick and a punch. Okay, great. Uh, but then I, I started doing boxing with my boy Jamal, who's on the podcast a lot. Mm -hmm. Any of the episodes with Jay is Into the Bat Cave. He is the uh, strength and conditioning coach, he used to be for Weidman. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and he's also the strength and conditioning coach and striking coach for uh, a lot of different things with Big Baby Miller, the mm -hmm. boxer and all mm -hmm. that stuff. So because we became friends, I started doing a lot of boxing with him in and out, in and out. And it's great because you learn how to throw punches. You learn how to, you know, bob and weave and stay yep. moving and, you know, read read your opponent and whatnot. But then when I just decided I want to take it to another level, I always wanted to wrestle. I just never wrestled. Yep. I always wanted to wrestle. And I always wanted to do jujitsu. I just was a little bitch about it. Mm -hmm. I remember paying for the fight to watch Sarah fight GSP. Oh. Or paying for the fight. I went over, I went to Wings Over Farmingdale oh. back in the day. Yo, yo, dude. Wings Over. I was going to Hooters when I was a kid watching those <laughs> fights. I should have just I got my that. driver's license at 18 and me and my boys, we would go to Hooters and watch the fights. I should have just done that because it would have yeah. saved me the 80 bucks. Oh, it was man. great. Because <laughs> it was like 80 on food, 80 on the fight. Nah. <laughs> how much, I don't even remember how much. I think it was 70, 80 bucks back then too. The, pe the Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The PPV. Yeah. Pay-per-view. So anyway, so I, I set everything up. My mom... You know, we showed me how to get it. We 
pay for the fight. Bro, I fell asleep before the fight even happened. Uh, I woke up and it was over. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that, you know, back then I didn't realize the fight started at one. Yep. Like the, the main, main, It's main. so bad now, especially now that we're older. Like I'll be laying there in bed like and like, you know, they have all these big fights going on. Uh, the, the other week, you know, was... Um, uh, 299. Yeah, it was, 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 was 299. You had Cheeto Vera, Sean O'Malley. Yep. And luckily uh, right now, you know, I was, I'm working nights, but I know for a fact that like if I was working days, I, I go to sleep not 9, 9.30, you know, like yeah. I'm out early. I wake up for the gym early, you know, and I'm laying there and I'm like you know you think to yourself like what's going through I guess Dana has to he has to accumulate to the rest of the world so luckily the west coast they get to watch this from 7 to 10 That's all. we have to watch it from 10pm to 2am I'm laying there I'm I'm knocking out Yeah, that's the prime time dude the the fight should start at 6, 5, 6 o'clock and and we should be going into main cards by like 9 yeah that should be the the, it should end at 10 latest it should end at fucking 11 Yeah, I'll get 11 I would even do 11 11. latest I'll give him 11 I'll give him 11 I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the main event at 1.30 in the oh, morning, man. especially the decision fights that, you know, they're five rounders and then you have like the co-main event five rounders. Yeah, and then you got the ads. Oh, it's oh, like, yeah. all right, I get y'all need to pay oh. the bills, but like, let's get it going. Yeah. So anyway, so I was watching all those, I, you know, I remember watching all that and I went to a trial class at Sarah's spot here yep. back in the day. I, I don't know who I did it with. I, I forget what, it might've been his brother, honestly, Nick. I think he has a Nick, brother. yeah, yeah, Nick, yeah. It might've been his brother. I don't really remember, but I they brought me in, I taught me a couple of things and I just I think I got uh scared from the price of the gym every month and from injuries. My mom got worried with yeah. the injuries and shit like that. It so it just never happened. Mm-hmm. So I said, you know what, fuck it. And then now I'm just like, you know what, making a little coin. You know, I'm I'm into doing different shit. I'm not doing bodybuilding stuff anymore. Yep. Let's dive in. And that's kind of what happened, man. I just I dove in and I've been loving it, dude. Yeah. It's just it's it's just a different world. It's 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 I've been so much calmer. It's so weird. It 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 humbles you. You know, like yeah. I like I said, martial artists are truly the most like passive people. Be like, cause like I would, you know, when I, I did Sarah's, and then I left Sarah's because at the time it was pricey for me. I wasn't making too much. I ended up going to the UFC gym in Farmingdale, and I continued there because I was doing the was MMA it a dual membership. Sort of, yeah, exactly. And it, it was great because like I was paying an X amount to hit the weights and you know and, and work out, but on top of that, like they had Muay Thai classes, they had Jiu Jitsu classes. And, you know, there is where I kind of developed more into no gi. Like, I started no gi when I was at Sarah's, but when I went there, like, I didn't have a gi and I didn't want to buy another one. Like, I was like, you know what? I want to develop my no gi a little bit more. I was debating on getting a gi because everything you do in jujitsu, and you know this as well, is it applies to real life. You know, gi is like if someone's wearing a jacket, you have grips around the collar, collar chokes, you know, you have all this other stuff. No gi is, you know, you and me going at it in a t shirt and shorts. You know, how, how do I get the advantage over you in just normal clothes. You know, gi, you have literally grips everywhere, but that's what gets the jujitsu fingers and yeah. you're going for collar chokes and, you know, you're going for wraparounds and this and that and the whole nine. And because there's so many, there's, you know, grab pant legs, you're grabbing this, you're grabbing that. So I kind of developed a lot of my no gi when I went to the UFC gym and then the, it, it closed down. But then when it closed down, I was looking for- Which one? The this Farmingdale? was Farmingdale. Yeah, it was Farmingdale. Farmingdale one closed down? It closed down. Behind the vitamin store that closed yep. down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right on Route 110. So they, so they closed down- um, and then I ended up, uh, it worked for me, I guess, because at the time I was looking for another place, but then I graduated, uh, Nassau community college and then I joined the military. And then when I got to my first duty station in South Korea, I ended up meeting up with a guy who's huge on MMA. Him and I started hitting pads and then like him and I started rolling and him and I were started to like, actually like teach like guys out there, like just basic jujitsu. Like, I mean, I was, I, I was a four striper, you know, I'm not going to say I was an expert by any means, but like I knew but more. So yeah. Than yeah. The common man. Well, exactly. Yeah. You know, and that, and that's how, like, that's how like I kind of, I, like I thought it and like I was able to get a lot of volunteer hours out of it. My evaluation looked good for the year. And like, it was just, it helped build camaraderie because guys were like, all right, what's this? Well, I'm teaching like an arm bar from, from basic guard, how to go from half you know if you're if you're in half guard how to get back to full guard you know bridges and bridge and roll what's an alternative to bridge and roll it just it was just more of whatever I knew you know and then like I would also learn as well by just going on YouTube because like at the time there was a jujitsu school out there but there was a big language barrier and me and my buddy Chris uh who was a big jujitsu guy as well we ended up competing out there just for that, just for the hell of it, you know? Yeah. And it was so funny story is we got to our first competition and this guy kept telling us it was Nogi. And we kept asking him over and over, it's like, it's Nogi. He's like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. Because what we did out there was Nogi. So we show up with our stuff and it's this big, you know, stadium in South Korea. So cool. And and it was, uh, no, we, we walk in, we're like, wow, this is going to be awesome. I was like, I don't even care if I lose today. Like this oh, is, yeah. yeah. CC yeah, 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 yeah. So I look around and then the guy's like, oh, and then he asks us, he puts in his Google Translate and he says, uniform. And I'm like, uniform like what are you talking about turns out it was a gi competition and me and my we look at each other and we're like 
uh, yeah, we don't have a gi. And then they're like, oh, hold on one second. Hold on one second. They come back. They got us two gis from two guy, two sweaty guys who just competed. Oh. They're like, hey, and, man. Fuck, yeah, they, they, they dried it off. And they're like, do you guys? And I looked at him. I'm like, listen, this is going to be a hell of a story in the yeah, future. Yeah, once in a lifetime. Yeah. And it was, you know, I we both lost first round. Uh, I got submitted in like two minutes. And he lost by points. He lost. Tough, like, tough yeah. dudes. Oh, tough dudes. And there's at the white belt level, too. Th this, this was white belt level. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I was wearing, you know, I was a white with four stripes. I had a, but the guy, the belt I was wearing, was like, it was white belt no matter how many stripes, whatever it was. I got submitted in like two minutes. He he lost by points, and it it was a lot of fun. But and then the and then the second one, same thing. Like it, like we went for we went for you know whatever it was, and then they told us it was gi again, and we went to the guy at the school. We're like, you gotta tell us, you yeah, know, we, like we gotta we gotta, like, we gotta figure this out, man. So yeah, but I know it's a couple of years later, but this could have helped. You. Yeah, yeah, Samsung, yeah, bro. exactly. This shit, you could talk, and it does the translating. It's so sick. Yeah, oh, well, it's so I, I can't I, wait to travel internationally to try it. I can't I wait. I think I was using Google Translate at the time, or but like when we show up for class. And he would go over the moves and then we'd roll with the guys. Like there wasn't really that much to talk about like doing that, but it was just like when it came to the competitions and I'm like this and that and the whole nine, but it was a lot of fun, you know, and I do think that MMA is a good basis or just any type of martial art, you know, that kind of just gets you ready for being a life. Yeah. For, 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 to go back to the point. For, it, go, it goes back to the, you know, the point, um, Bradley Martin, huge guy, you know, obviously, you know, big, big bodybuilder, you know, he's, he's, he's so tired of seeing the clips of him. Like, Oh, how much you weigh, bro? How yeah, you, weigh, bro? you know, so he, he's this huge dude that actually, and I don't know if you saw, but like he, I don't, I don't know if he called out Nate Diaz or Nate Diaz. I mean, Nate Diaz is a clown anyway, but like, well, I know he was, well, he wasn't one of the, one of them was on his podcast. And yeah. He and he's like, Oh yeah, I would tool, I, he, I would tool you. Yeah. Like, like, I would, I would smack you. I'm like, Hey, sub. I was like, Nate Diaz, he may be 180 pounds soaking wet and he has absolutely no muscle on him. I was like, this man will ruin you. Like, yeah, could you, uh, you know, will, will Bradley Martin maybe, you know, get a clean shot and stone him cold and that's it. The second you fall to your knee, that man is going to twist you like a pretzel and there's do things. So much, there's you, only so much strength will get you. And yeah. There's only so many places that it will. And I've learned that as well in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I've pulled off the gas on a lot of the strength stuff that I do because, listen, there's a lot of kids that I could just toss in that class. Yeah. I could fucking toss people. And I don't because I use my strength when I have to and when I need to. And I've had a couple of guys from Bev's come and join mm -hmm. Sarah's and they're learning and they're going, oh shit, like, yeah, it's different than what we thought. And then they go, yo, man, this is this is, this is is a different challenge. This is what I wanted. And one of the worst things you can do as a smaller guy, and I learned this at 16, 17 when I first joined Sarah's, was, you know, the last thing you want to be is on the offensive against the guy who's bigger than you and he's on top of you. Like, when they would get on top of me, I would just let them, I would try to let them gas out. And I would just, I, I would just fight defensively and just, Prevent the prevent advancements, prevent submissions, and and, and then just Try wait to until not let them not let you breathe. Yeah, exactly. You know, and and you know what? Most of the time they would get me because I was not only was I small, but I was also a starter. You know, I wasn't like Mikey Musemi, 120 years old, spinning like a top. You know, I was a little 16 year old white belt, and I had these you know 25, 30, 35 year old guys that are just twice my size. At the time, I was only. Oh man, one I was like 130 myself. You know, I I I I had no muscle back then, so it was just like one of those things, but. I think um, yeah, MMA and and martial arts is is very is very comparative to being ready for the real world. And well, I I believe functional type fitness and movements yes. are imperative. It's it, it it's a combination of the two. Like I'm not I can't I'm not going to sit here and say okay, just do MMA, but don't do weight training. Cause well, I think that MMA can be considered functional fitness. It can be. Well. That's what it, I'm saying. It can be. I believe when I say functional fitness, I mean martial art type type of uh, modalities, and I mean weight training type stuff. It doesn't have to be CrossFit specifically. It doesn't have to be bodybuilding type specifically, but I think when you bridge the gap to, together, of course. you start getting like really into life training. Of course, yeah, exactly. You know, And, and that's like... You know, you have guys that are in ridiculous shape that don't even look it. And the guy I just talked about before, Nate Diaz, that guy, he's he's flat as a pancake. He can run twenty miles and, and not even sweat. Yeah. You know, and, and he and he and he's puffing on like six, seven blunts a day and he's outworking literally everyone in the room, you know? Like yeah. he no, but that's how he is, you know. Yeah. All the all the post, you know, post fights, he's token and he's like, Oh, I'll do this, I'll do he is so you know, he's all messed up, whatever he is, but he's he's a, he's a tank. He's an absolute monster. You know, like, yeah, he loses a lot, but, like, he he has an endless gas tank, too. You know, the fights with Connor, like, you know, he just, his first round is where he starts up, and then he just keeps working and working and yeah. working, you know? It's like and, Marab. Marab has yeah. like an oh. unlimited tank. That's going to be a he, good fight, that, man. I, that, Him and O'Malley? I, well, O'Malley, you know, O'Malley's trying to be the shot caller now, so, like, Marab, you know, he's like, oh, if you want me to knock out Marab, I'll knock him out, too, but, like, there's oh. so, there's so I, I don't know, man. Oh, dude, I, I mean, he pieced up. 
up Cheeto though. Dude, he pieced I heard, up I Cheeto. I heard about Marab a long time ago, like from seven, yeah, 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 a year yeah, yeah, ago. Yeah. You ever trained with him? You ever rolled? No, with I haven't. I've, I've I've rolled with Steamroller. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I Steamroller. Love, I, love, I, love, I, I love Matt. Matt's the homie. Uh, I've I've trained while um, I've trained while uh, Sterling uh, Aljamain. Yep. Aljo is uh, at the gym. I've trained like next to him. I haven't trained with him particularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, he was very nice, super cool. I haven't met Marab yet, but yeah. I, I you hear about him through the networks. Yeah. And you know, you heard a lot of things about like they didn't want them to go against each other because they're teammates and this and that. So controversy. Listen, whatever yeah. it might be, whether that's the case or not, I have no idea. But all I know, Aljo is, went up to one forty five now. Exactly. So, that's that's that. Yeah. And then on on top of that. You know, dude, this guy's got a, I've heard chin like a like a fucking cement truck. He got he's and he's got a, a gas for days. And he dude, he who was the dude he just fought? He did, did, I would say, did you just did you watch his fight with Cejudo? That was it, Cejudo. Now, granted, Cejudo's a little older, older but, like, but dude, Olympic style wrestler, Olympic and, wrestler, and he would just walk with him and smile at Dana and then slam him, took him right on his shoulder. Insane. Yeah, he's he's fucking ridiculous. These, Euro, these European guys are nuts. Dude, <laughs> built the Dagestani. Right? Yep. Dude, dude's built different, man. That's a different type of a person. That's a person that's like a Batman villain. Like, yeah, he's a yeah, really good yeah. guy. Not to say oh, he's yeah. a villain. Yeah. But that's the dude that, like, worked out in a fucking cave all his life and just, that was the only thing he knew was just getting in and fighting and grappling and doing everything. And then when given the opportunity on the big stage, all of his years of training that yeah. everyone never saw, now it's front and center and he just piecing dudes up. Oh, yeah. But, you know, Crazy. so it's like, it's awesome to see guys doing that and taking care of yourself that way. But, and that, and, and, and doing MMA and jujitsu and being ready for real life leads into the next topic that is, it, it goes into, it's like, okay, now you know how to fight on the ground. Now you know how to fight on your feet. Do you know how to fight with a weapon? You know, like now, now you get into, you know, do you, you know, I get, and listen, there it's, you know, the second amendment is one of the most controversial things you could talk to anyone about in the history of mankind. I'm not saying you got to walk around with a pistol everywhere and this and that the whole night, but do you know how to try to defend yourself against a knife attack? Do you carry a knife on you? You know, I, anyone could carry a pocket knife on them, you know, and, and you'd rather have something on you than nothing. I carry a knife with me pretty much everywhere I go except the gym. Yeah. I, so, I usually have one on me. I don't have one on me right now. I, I got one on me right yeah, now, cool. you know, so, I mean, but I, I, but I work in the city. I usually, so. <laughs> I usually don't have, I usually have one on me right now. And that's actually why I've been wearing more and more jeans yeah. because I'm getting used to having the belt on and mm -hmm. carrying because then when I get concealed, I yep. want to be able to have it on me mm -hmm. uh, for different purposes if I deem it so. But I, I would I would say that there's a there's a mixed bag in this topic. There's a mixed bag because there are people that either have been introduced to firearms at a young age and yep. they're very comfortable with them or even at a later age like me that are very comfortable with them because you have friends that teach you the right way to do things mm -hmm. and the responsible way to hold guns and every gun is loaded no matter what like yeah. just even if it's empty it's loaded like mm -hmm. we're not pointing it at people we're not nope. pointing it at ourselves we're we're keeping good trigger finger like trigger finger off of everything these are the things that you know you learn as a responsible gun owner but yep I would say on the on the opposite end of the spectrum, I believe that there's a lot of people that are afraid of firearms, afraid of knives, of real not like not not yeah. cutlery. You know, no, like yeah, but the same thing basically, just less sharp. And because of what happens in the world, you read about stabbings, you read about shootings, yeah. and you're like, oh, I'm afraid of this. But then it's like, and I and the fear stems from the unknown of not actually understanding this thing. I yeah. had said this on another episode. I have a buddy. His girl is a teacher. She's very very left leaning. Listen, don't matter whatever you, wherever you lean. I'm not here to talk about left, right, up, or down. Oh you know? no! Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've listened to any of my episodes, I yeah. don't know fuck what anybody is. Yep, exactly. Anybody. Yeah. So she just leans very left, and because of that, her preconceived notion is absolutely no guns, absolutely no yep. weapons, absolutely no that. that. And it's just like, and I've talked to her before, and I just said, listen, you have to just open your mind a little bit. It's not that you are wrong; it's that you're afraid of something because you're constantly told by the places that you look for news the people that you converse with, that these are demonized things. And yep. the gun's not just going to get up and go shoot somebody. It has to, has to have like a catalyst of somebody using it. Yep. Like that, that's the whole way that the gun functions. The, yep. Is it, you know, the, the guns that are in my house, the guns that are in your house, the guns that are in every, how many people's houses across the country? The millions and millions and millions of gun owners. It's weird. They, they don't get up and they don't just kill people in the middle of the night. But I, all it takes is one bad apple to spoil the bunch. Exactly. You know, next week they're unfortunate. You know what? And there probably will be a shoot. I mean, listen, I, I read about shootings in the city and all these other places every single day. Yeah. Not many people know about it because they don't know where to look, but it's like, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it, it's not like a spoon. You can't blame a spoon for making you fat, right? So it's like, I mean, some people can. Yeah, some people you know, can. but it's one of those things where it's like, at the end of the day, Firearms will always be controversial to the public because of what offensive do what offensive people do with it and what defensive people do with it. You know, like 
I've been a firearm owner since 2018 and I go to like my friends that are scared of guns. I'm like, you tell me the last time I went and shot someone. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I keep my guns locked up. I train with them for a purpose. But like I also st like you, I started as a kid, you know, I started I was a kid with Nerf guns. And then from Nerf guns, I upgraded to BB guns. And then from BB guns, I upgraded to I started uh, shooting small 22 with um, my great uncle who lives in Delaware. Joined the military, went into an MOS that, you know, as being an MP, you know, we got introduced to the Beretta M9. I was shooting the Mossberg 500. Um, you know, I, I got training on an M4, AR-15, you know, probably one of the most controversial pieces of weaponry in, in the United States history, you know. And then when I deployed, you know, and, and, then, and then when I deployed, I got hands on machine guns, grenade launchers, you know, I was shooting all that stuff and having a ton of fun, you know. But like, so I got, you know, and then I came home, bought more stuff. And now, you know, and you know, because I've texted, you know, I try to, I, I go to the range, you know, I try to go to the range once or twice a month, you know, I try to do some indoor training with pistol and then I do some outdoor training with my rifle. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I'm never going to say someone needs to get a concealed carry permit and needs to do this and needs to do that. But I just want, it's more of a thing of like, people need to just keep their minds open about like everything that goes on around them. And it goes into, you know, it's like one of those things, like you said, like, you know, you have a friend who's a teacher or, you know, and they're leaning to the left and they're afraid of this, this and that, so on and so forth. Your politics and, and your views are, are a reflection of your reality. Right. So, and I mean, and I, what I say by that is hi, generally, generally speaking here, like education is left leaning. First responders and military are usually right leaning, you know, like everyone you know, in politics are just a mess as it is. But like, if you, you get rid of the two, first of all, we got to get rid of a two party system. Well, that, that, that's does, another thing. Yeah. You nothing, know, like nothing but pit everybody against it, each other. It's it, bullshit. It is. I'm tired of having these geriatric fucks in the office. That's, that's what I'm tired what of. What annoys me more than anything is, and it's with the controversy of the second amendment is like, when I go on Instagram and Facebook, it's left leaning people complaining about this, right leaning people complaining about this and upside down people complaining about this. And all they do is complain about politics and what's in their lives. And they and it's feed like, the algorithm too. Yeah, exactly. Enjoy. And, 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 and now, now you just got people talking about it and now you just got them paid, you know, and, and politicians always need to promise you something in order to get elected into office. You know, they'll keep saying, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to create this. Oh, I'm going to ban this. I'm going to create this. I'm going to ban this. And most of the time it never happens. No, it never, you know? it never happens because they because have they to don't... promise you stuff. They don't give a fuck. They don't care about you. They and don't it... care about you. They don't care about your rights. They don't, nope. they act like they do. They're, they are some of the best actors in the world for a lot of people that believe that shit they're better than some of the actors in hollywood with how they act with, yeah. with certain things and you know just like you said it's just it's all about having a, a hold of power over the people that's mm -hmm. really what it winds up being yeah uh to just go back to my buddy's girl yeah my 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 biggest thing with her was you have to look at things with an open mind so it's not a matter of you need to like you said you don't have to go get a concealed carry you don't have to do all of that but at least having a basic understanding of a firearm, you're in schools. They're gun-free zones. Unfortunately... Does it work? <laughs> unfortunately, you know, when you tell criminals that or people that are trying to do harm to others, hey, you're not allowed to use a gun in this area. Or some of the signs that I laugh at when I drive past schools are, this is a drug-free school. Really? Okay. Uh, let, let, have all the students come out, especially in the high schools, obviously have all the students come out and let's clear out all the backpacks. Let me see what's what we got here, because I'm going to prove to you that that sign doesn't work. New York city, every corner you go, you see, this is a gun free zone. You want me to pull up statistics of every shooting that's happened in New York city? Like, it's, dude, it's what do you think? Then, do you think a sign is going to stop, you know, people? To, and we have to stop leaning with our feelings. And yeah. We have to lead more with like logic and statistics, real statistics. Yeah. Not bullshit. That just, uh, that just adheres to the agenda that you're trying to have. Uh, be the main point of view. Yeah. So you know when you start seeing that, oh, this is a this is a gun free zone. Okay. Why do all the shootings seem to happen in gun free zones? I don't know. It seems like that's a strange thing. Because you just told responsible people they can't bring a gun, they and then that you're and that irresponsible people don't care about that. Sign I've had and this they conversation. I've things. had this conversation with friends too, and I've said, yep. you know, I've said, why is it that they don't have as many mass shootings in Texas and, and Florida? I don't know because if a dude pulls up and he's looking to do a mass shooting, quote unquote, you know, mm -hmm. he's looking to harm as many humans as you as possible in a short amount of time. If you pull up to a place in Florida and you start counting, oh, there's 50 people here. There's a good chance that 20 to 30 are strapped. Yep. 
I'm probably not going to get get the the odds that I want in my favor, and that, they're going to go somewhere else. Places like here, places like Chicago, have the most shootings without. They have the most offensive shootings without any defensive shootings. Taking police officers out of the question because you know obviously that's their job to respond and to to, to take down the threat. If you look at offensive shootings and defensive shootings, you know one was there. There are articles and there's many people you know who you know who they call good Samaritans that will take down bad guys and you know when they can. Uh, I'm not sure. That's where, a fucking risk, man, and that's a risk because you're going to be persecuted for that. One of the craziest things I saw persecuted prosecuted both yeah, yeah both yeah both yeah one of the craziest things oh, I forgot what state it was it was somewhere in, in 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 the midwest and some guy came into a mall with a rifle and I always so I you know I have a carry permit through the navy I carry in highly populated places I carry when I go to the grocery store I carry when I go to the mall I carry when I go to the movies you know but like I don't carry going to the gym I don't you know anything like that I only carry that's in, tough though yeah then you got to take it off and then you got to leave it somewhere exactly my, my mind would always be on yeah where's the gun where's the where's it, my gun? It, exactly like it, it, my gun's either in my safe or on me and, yes. and, and, and it's and it's and it's neither one of the two so it, when people it, lock shit up in cars I'm like oh please don't leave I would your, never please don't leave your gun in the car please don't do because that because you you could you if someone breaks into your car and take it like, like if I left my gun in, a, in my car and someone broke it and took it, I would be done for. Oh yeah, you know, totally, I would yeah. be absolutely done for. Sorry, anyway, back to you. No, 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 that's okay. So, so, so this guy came into a mall. I have to. There's an article on it somewhere, but he came into a mall with a rifle and some like 19 year old kid with a stock Glock 43 or 45. I, like I heard about this too. With a stock Glock 45. This guy came out with a rifle. I think he shot one or two people, injured them. They didn't kill. You know him. the kids. Do you know the name? No, 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 no. It's 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 somewhere on Google. If you search, if you search, oh god, you know. Somewhere in the Midwest, Idaho, Ohio. Uh, we, I got now. I'm gonna, now I'm gonna rush to find it like you. Uh, more shooting. Stopped. Rush. I'm, I'm racing you, bro. Oh yeah, Elijah Dickin, 22. This was Indiana. Yeah, I got it. Indiana. Yep. Yeah, 22. Was Gestured to other shoppers to flee as he engaged and closed in on the suspect. Yep. Gangster. Gunman had two rifles, a handgun, and more than a hundred, uh, hundred rounds of bullets. That's weird, though. Aren't aren't malls gun free zones? I, I I'm I'm pretty sure they are. But so so he so he he heard gunfire, and he he went he took his he took his gun out. He put this guy down at twenty yards with one shot. Yeah, man, one shot. But he that's put all it takes, down. and you know that exactly. But you know you know you know you, you know how many how many people probably don't even know about that story because they don't want to listen to it. They don't want you know? they, not even that they don't want to listen to it. They don't want to project that out there that somebody did something good. Good with a gun because there's no because in in a certain world there's no such thing as it's good. So guys with scary. Guns. Like, yeah, it's just it's so scary. That's why I have to sit here and wait. Two years yep. for a CCW well, for that's, a handgun. That's New York and politics. While, <laughs> while, while I go buy a shotgun in ten minutes, yeah, because I have no record. Yep, and they and and rifles and whatever else I want, mm -hmm. I go buy it in ten minutes. Yep, because they're like, oh yeah, he's clean. Well, why is it? Oh, because the little scary concealable one. But I could do ten times more damage with a rifle or a shotgun. Yep. So and that's why most of these the logic? mass shooters and and offensive shooters they come with rifles. They don't. Yeah, do they don't. Have, they, they don't practice with these guns. Exactly. Right. They miss all the time. Exactly. These people. Yeah. You know, they're just going around. Well, I, regular people don't understand how hard it is to actually shoot and hit on target. Yep. Repeatedly. Yes. Repeatedly and accurately and just while there's things going on, they yeah. have no idea how hard it is to just go bump, 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 bump. Just even in that succession. Yep. Not even quick. Just yep. bump, bump, bump. Fucking missed all the time. That's why, like, and especially when I do like my not even like, you know, my, my rifle training is just about really getting on target because it's not like I'm walking around and I'm never gonna walk around in, in public with a rifle. But when I do like my pistol training, you know, I, I do some friendly competitions too. Uh me and my friend Chris, we were doing uh some like USPCA competitions in Freeport, which was a lot of fun. Can you let me know when yeah. you do another one? Because so, I really want to do it when I get my license. So they stopped for a little bit. Uh some guy stepped down. I'm trying to find more, but I haven't done it in a while. But I was doing one like once a month and it was great. You go do a course of fire, this, that. I bought a belt and all, you know, and, and it was, you know, trying to get on target. And, and listen, there are guys there with like staccatos that shoot like a grouping like this yeah. at like 30 yards. But I always told myself, I'm like, if I have to shoot a pistol at 30 yards, I got a real big fucking problem. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, it, it, don't get me wrong. It's always good to train distance. But how I try to train, and there's a guy on YouTube and Instagram, and I'm going to send him your link because I follow a lot of his stuff when, when I'm like watching his stuff and I'm not doing anything. Um, I think his name is Colin. He runs T-Rex Arms. I don't know if you ever heard of T-Rex Arms. So is he black kid? No, he's a white guy. Oh, you don't know, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Colin. Yeah, yes, Colin Noir. Colin, Colin. Yeah, Colin Colin. Yeah, Colin. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he he does a lot of podcasts and talks about the Second Amendment and guns. Yeah. This guy does just a lot of training videos. That's cool. And stuff like that. And he 
walks through like you know how to effectively shoot a pistol how to do this how to, he's not military he's not a cop he's just a normal dude that loves guns and this guy can outshoot and outclass you know and any guy that you know that's on the job or, or whatever the case may be um you know but he has really good training videos and he i get a lot of my training from him because he'll be like all right you know do this course of fire and it's like you know like or you know draw you know put two rounds on reload you know whatever like my my, my like i'll work my concealed draws you know like yeah, two in the chamber like well, two, one in the chamber well if i'm carrying here it's like lifting the shirt up coming up this and that you know how long it takes me to lift my shirt up get the gun out get my gun forward you know like every now you've used the mantis well mantis there's a mantis piece that you can use in the house to practice and it oh those dry fire trainings it does all of the dry fire like numbers for you so you could just be able to i always record everything i always wanted to get into into something like that and my girlfriend sent me a link for something like that and i've been meaning to buy it i just forget but there are times at home where like if i'm not doing anything it's not often but like i'll be home and if i'm not doing anything i'll just like stand there and i'll put my rig on and i'll just practice coming up obviously i clear you know i clear everything but i i just practice coming up coming down coming up coming down you know and then it's like then it's then you know then it's getting on target and i'm shooting certain targets and it's like obviously you want everything to be center mass like right in the middle but it's just like if, as long as you know in my mind like you know obviously i want to hit as close to center mass as possible but i'll work a drill at five yards and i'll work a drill at seven yards and i'll work a drill at 10 you know there's a, there's a drill that he was doing um and i just kind of work from there man you know it's, it's all just about practicing and it's not just you know a lot of people with guns they just they're like, oh, cool, I have a gun. Let me, you know, go to the range and get on target. Yes, getting on target is important, but especially now, it's in the state of New York, you know, people are working on their concealed carries and stuff like that. Like, you can go on Amazon, get a $20 holster and just practice dry firing from home. And you could practice concealed drawing out of range. I yeah. mean, yeah, you're not going to, but like, you know, train how you fight, right? You know, you know, so it's like when you're in public and you're looking around, like, especially like the heavily, heavily populated places, you know, I'm always just I'm I'm hyper alert when when I'm when I'm walking around. Like when I work in the city, when I go, my volume on my headphones is at like the bare minimum. I'm not, I refuse to take my phone out unless I have a phone call, and I'm constantly just like yeah. looking around, especially on the subway too. You know, the subway, I'm just you know I'm sitting there and I'm just I'm not sitting there like this, but like I mean I'm I'll be looking down at the floor and I'll just like kind of be doing this, doing that. You know, there was a guy next to me, you know, that one time, and he was you know super covered up and like look whatever, and then I was sitting off to the side of him. And I had like, I was like this, he got up, he just, I thought he was sleeping, uh, train stopped, he jumped up and a giant knife fell out of his pocket, you know? And then I got nervous. So I put my hand to my pocket you know, like whatever, you know, I was like, all right, like what's about the, I mean, he wasn't taking it out, but he just like picked it up and got off the train. But like, I like snap of a finger. I was like, you know, like what's, what's going on here? You know, just people need to be really aware of what's going on around them. And if you're not going to get a carry permit, fine. I respect that. Carry a pocket knife. Women need to carry bear spray, you know, mace, you know. And also or, understand like, what the law is for the knives, too. Exactly. Certain, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to say go out and take a steak no, knife no, with no, you, no, you no. know. But like There's you, a certain length and whatnot. Yeah, and but, you, but you can get like, you know, an inch, inch and a half, you know, just have something. And like I always tell, and you know, all women, you know, they should carry, even men all, too. All, all women should carry the cat lady. That's yep. the one. Yeah. I, I got to get a sponsorship. I've, this is like the third time I shout these people out. Cat lady or something, whatever it is. What, what, are, they, are, are they a mace company? Nah, so what it is is it's like these wolverine claws that go between it's almost like they look like bare um they look like uh brass knuckled sort of but they okay. don't wrap around each digit they just kind of sit in yeah and then if god forbid a woman is in an attack she squeezes it and these little prongs come out and you could scratch a dude and it takes his dna too yeah oh and it's it that's pretty cool it keeps it in the actual unit so yeah. I mean, people that don't know what that is they're not gonna you know they should they they may get slashed they may continue attacking or flee now yeah in that unit and even if they don't god forbid an attack goes further eventually, oh yeah eventually they're gonna leave yeah most times they leave and then you still have that. They're not going to, oh, give me that. Yeah, yeah. Give me the cat. I need, I need your blood. Come here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I need the cat. They, they have that and they also not, if you, even if you don't want to get violent, they have those, um, those little sound machines, you know what I'm talking about, where they hit something and yeah. it's like the loudest thing my mom you can possibly. My mom bought me one of those. Yeah. Ones. Kenji, I go, you realize I have a 90 pound Akita, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Who clearly, you know, yeah. he's, he's, like, he's sniffing me out. He's like, yo, I'm going to mess you up, you know? So, <laughs> such a dick. you know, but like, I'm not, you don't even have to carry to, they don't even have to carry a weapon. I mean, I, I personally believe in carrying a weapon, but like just carry something that's going to make you aware of what's going on around you, you know, and if and if, and if you're walking around a place where that's not known to be safe or whatever, just all you got to do is t have that thing in your pocket and you just hit a button and then just, you know. So, but it's just, it's, it's a tiger lady, tiger lady. Damn, there I've been is. fucking up cat lady. There it is. Tiger. I was like, I got to know what it is. Tiger lady. That's what it looks like.
Oh, that looks painful. Yeah, oh yeah, that looks very painful. Oh, you get you get a you get a right cross with that. Yeah, it's over, dude. Yeah, oh yeah, it's over, man. You get a right cross with that, you know. But it's just and it's important to kind of going back to what I said before is you know it's important to when you have a gun because I know a lot of guys that have guns and they only shoot like once a year. You know, they like and I try to like for the qualifying. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, well, not even just like uh, cops. Yeah, like there are definitely cops out there that just shoot on their qualifying and then they put them away. But it's like. Definitely with them and military, you know, I, I have to qualify twice. Even as a reservist, I still have to qualify twice a year because I carry when I go on my active training in Italy and if I deploy and stuff like that, you know. So it's like, but I try to put a good amount of my, you know, especially as hobbies, you know, I definitely consider shooting one of my hobbies and it's just like constantly buying ammo, doing this, doing that, you know. And But it's just like training to a certain expectation and... You know, I'm never going to get better unless I constantly do something over and over and over. And that's that applies to everything in life. And there was a, a quote that I found that I definitely wanted to bring up today. And it goes that we never rise to the level of our expectations. We only fall to the level of our training. So if you set a bar this high and you don't do anything to constantly try to get to that bar, whatever it may be, benching 275, trying to, you know, do a, do a holstering drill in less than five seconds, you know, you're never going to get to benching 275 if you don't work your weights up, you know? Like, if you're just constantly, like, you know, obviously when you're building strength, you want to, you know, do 175, 200, 225, but you're never going to get there if you just keep repping out 175 for 15, 20, 15, 20, you know? Like, you're never going to get that weight up. I'm never going to get my, you know, my holstering drill, you know, if I'm going to get two rounds out, reload, and two rounds less than five seconds, if I keep giving myself eight seconds to do it, you know? Yeah. Like, or, or if I'm not, or if it's an if it's a concealed draw, but I'm drawing from the outside, you know? You have to be practicing with everything you do in life and it's important to be precise you know like if you have something you know like you only train to what you have you know how much you can lift how fast you can run how how much you can shoot how much you can do this you know and I feel like that's pretty important because a lot of people they'll be like oh I'm doing this or I'm doing that and then it's just like something happens and, and it's like oh well what happened here and it's like ah oh, well I didn't do this I didn't do that but it's like whose whose fault is that yeah. you know so it's like you know, we have, we, it's always good to set a standard and be respectful of that standard and respectful of the people who set that standard for you, you know, but ultimately it comes down to you and, and, and what you're doing, you know, and there's so much more to it too. Um, when it comes to setting a standard for, you know, because like, let, let, let's just talk about like, you know, weightlifting and training and stuff like that. I'm never... What my motivation through strength training and weightlifting, whatever the case may be, injuries or no injuries, is I may not be the strongest guy in the room, I may not be the fastest guy in the room, but I'm constantly going to try to chase them and be that. I'm, you know, that, that that's that's the basis of it. You know, uh, every, I mean, OG man, monsters, monsters and animals. You know, everyone goes there and and you know, and it was OG is a great place. You know, where you just punch it for an hour and you just go and go and go. But one of the things that always annoyed me, and Evan knows this, was a lot of people would show up late. And there's a difference when you're having, you run late one day, this, that, the whole nine. But aside from, I was, I was, you and me, you know, I was, you and me were mainliner 615ers, you know, before, you know, I got all jammed up or whatever it was. I was at the 16, 615 every single day. And aside from the Goodell sisters, shout out Nicole and Alyssa, because you, cause, cause, cause you, cause you guys were early and you guys were awesome. Yeah. I walked in that door no later than six o'clock every single day. So as people were walking out, I'd be walking in. And you had some people kind of trickle in this, that, the whole nine. But then like Evan would be going over, you know, the, like the, like, you know, the class and going over what we're doing. And then people would just walk in, but it was the same people walking in late all this, all the time. And then they're like, oh, well I did this today. And they're putting up an Instagram story, worked hard, this and that. No, no, no. You didn't work hard. You missed two stations and you came in at 625, 630. And then, you know, when all of a sudden we start up, oh, what are we doing here? Oh, what are we doing here? Why? Why are you coming in late? You know, show this man some respect. You know, there was one time, um, there was one time where I, I, could, I thought I couldn't get to a class in the morning and then I ended up being able to get in and I saw that it was full, but I texted Evan. I'm like, yo, I'm showing up at six. I know there's going to be about four people showing up at 630. I should take their spot. I'm dedicated, you know, like I'm, I'm here to give respect to you because I'm, if you're today, you told me to be here at 10, I was here at 946, right? Yeah. You know, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. You know, I am never, ever, ever late to anything. And I'm always early to something just because I feel, you know, when you're early, you give yourself time. And that's, I guess, a military thing too. The military always told me if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. 
you know? And then I, I, I walked in and I'm like stretching out and stuff. And I think he made the rule that, uh, he made the rule that like, if, if, if you got there after the demo, then you gave up your spot if someone was waiting. And I said, how about punishment? I was like, how about a hundred burpees? You know, if, if they walk in after the demo, you know, maybe if there's a spot open, that's fine. It is what it is. But like, you know, that, that starts the standard right there is like, you know, if you're going to group fitness or just, that's just an example. If you're going to group fitness, like show up early for your coaches, you know, get loose. I mean, a broken guy like me has to stretch out for, you know, 10 minutes regardless, you know, I'm so worse. I'm the worst. Yeah. I, wake, I wake up like for a six, <clears throat> I wake up at, I mean, I was waking up at 445 for a while and then I wake up, then, you know, even now I wake up at like five, even for jujitsu this morning, I woke up at. Six o'clock. I walked Kenji by. Yeah, I'm talking about you, bro. Yep. I <laughs> I, I walked Kenji by six fifteen. We walked for like a half hour just to give him something. Six forty five. Mm -hmm. I left. I got to Sarah's by six fifty five. Yeah. And then class started ten minutes later. And I, I mean, I, I cracked my back twice. Oh, and I was oh like, all God, right, let's it, go, it, let's roll, roll. And you know that you feel it, man. You so you got to get there. You got to give yourself the time. I'm. I'm 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 not sitting here puffing my chest out saying that that's the oh cool, hell no that's the cool way to do shit. It's not. I should I should be stretching more and I should be warming up. And what's crazy? I and mean, listen, everyone's different, and I get that. You know, the craziest things that I saw though were like, and I, maybe they're uh, younger and more limber, and I get that because you know my body's taken a beating over the years. Um, but like you know, there are people that could just walk into OG and then and then Evan will be like, oh, you know, we're doing a, th a thousand meter sprint today, and they do it without even stretching. And I'm like, if I don't stretch for at least ten minutes before I do this, I'm pulling something and I'm out. <laughs> you know, like I'm out for weeks. you know, I'm out for weeks. When I was younger, I used to be able to do that. You know, when I was like 21 to 25, I might, you know, my time overseas were probably that was when I was in the best shape of my life. You know, when I was out party and drink until like three, four in the morning. And then we wake up for like PT at like seven or eight and I could run five miles, no sweat, you know? Like it was just, it was waking up like, oh man, take like a hangover shot or like a big chug of water. And I would just go. Now if I, you know, I need eight hours of sleep, I need to put the cucumbers over my eyes, oh, yeah. you know? Like, man, spot yeah, yeah. Spot you know, I was, I was, I, I'm always, you know, and it's, and, and it's funny, I, I, I tell my girlfriend, Carrie, cause when she first met me, like I would be rubbing my eyes or this and that. She's like, are you all right? Are you tired? I'm like, I've been tired for the past eight years. I'm going to be tired for eight more. <laughs> you know, like I'm just I'm constantly tired. I'm going to be tired for yeah. the amount of time I got left on this planet. Yep, exactly. Like I'm never going to be fully rejuvenated. I'm just all messed up from from, from what it was. But it's I, had just, this, I had this debate with, with uh, a buddy of mine. It's would you rather be tired and beat up and sore and all that stuff, or would you rather be probably a different type of tired because you're sick from not being able to train or not training and staying healthy? And your body feels a little bit better, but it's actually rotting from the inside. So it's like the first one. Yeah. hundred I mean, percent. The I, first I, one. I, I know logical people are going to pick the first one. Yeah. But, you know, then there's people that just hate the gym and they just don't want to exercise at all. I'm very glad you brought that up because that, that brings me to, we keep going into the good points that I want to talk about. So I definitely would say the first one and I'll tell you why. And I kind of just said this, you know, like I'm still in pretty good shape. You know, I definitely take care of myself. I do what I can. Am I in the shape that I was before? No. Am I also riddled with a bunch of injuries? Yes. You know, so I'm trying to just preserve my health and stay loose and this and that and the whole nine. There was a time where, uh, and I specifically remember it is, uh, we all know Rob. We love Rob, right? Rob. Big Young? Yeah, Rob. Rob jo Joe Silberti's roommate, right? As, as he referred to him. Big Young? Yeah, big guy is an absolute monster. And when he gets to the gym, he locks in. There's time where I look at him and, you know, where we would be like make faces and smirk. But like that guy, you know, we would just go. And then we get on stations together and this and that. And he, he great dude. An absolute truck of a human being. And one day after class, he was looking down and he looked discouraged. And I'm like, what's up, man? What's going on? He's like, ah, oh. he's like. You know, he's like, I, t today wasn't my day. He's like, I couldn't get this up. I couldn't get that up, you know, whatever. I was like, let me tell you something, man. I was like, perspective is everything in life. Now, if you're normally shoulder pressing 65, 70s, and they, that day you were sore and you only got up 40, 45s, being able to move your body is a gift. And I looked at him and I said that there are millions and millions, maybe I could even argue tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people who wake up every day and they don't do anything. They don't go for, I'm not saying you have to, you know, it's not like, oh, if you don't go to, you know, like if you're not doing a hardcore, you know, fitness class for an hour, you're, you know, you're a scrub, you know, but like going for a walk, going for a run. Yes, weight training, this, that, but like just being able to move your body and get into fitness is a gift. There are people that were born without limbs there are veterans who come back missing legs, missing arms, and I follow all these guys on Instagram. There's one dude, I forgot his last name, it's Tyler something. 
he was blown up in Afghanistan. He lost an arm and he lost a leg. And this guy is in the gym deadlifting with one arm, leg pressing with one leg. And he's, and his, and all his cat, you know what his captions are? What's your fucking excuse? You know? And there are people with two arms and two legs that wake up every day and just treat themselves like shit. They binge eat, they do this, they do that. And everyone's different. Maybe there's outside factors and is with, but I went to Rob and I'm like, listen, man, you're going to have your good days and you're going to have your bad days. I was like, there's days where I, you know, would come in here and feel on top of the world and I did great. There are days where I would leave in pain or I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't go that heavy today. Maybe I should go a little bit lighter. And that's still me every day when I go to the gym. And I'm like, just understand that when you come here and you dedicate yourself to fitness for an hour, that's all you need. You know, like you need that momentum and that drive to run this amount, to bike this amount. Yeah. You might shoulder press 65s or 70s five days of the week, and then on the last day, you're only doing 30s because you're so beat up. Obviously, rest days are important, but just the fact that you got up and you went and you took time out of your sleep and out of your routine to go to the gym and haul ass is a blessing and a gift, you know? Fast and the Furious, 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing, right? So, you know, I and I try to like, and that's what I, and he, and he looked at me and like, there were times too, even after that, like, you know, he'd be like, oh, this, that, the whole night. I'm like, hey, you got up and moved today. And that's, that's a gift. And he would just look at me. He's like, you know what, man, you're right. You know? And like, I try to tell people, you know, and there's nothing wrong with swinging for the fences and, you know, and, and, and going, and, and going, you know, balls to the wall and this, that, the whole nine. But I feel like, and maybe this is just my perspective, but like, the older we get, you still kind of have to be careful because like we become a lot more injury prone the older we get. The younger we are, like, yeah, you might hurt something, but whatever. Now it takes us longer to heal, you know, like we have this, we have that, you know. So it's like, I feel, and I'm not just saying like trying to, you know, wimp out of something because I'm not David Goggins running 200 miles a day at the age of like 51 or something, you know, and doing doing a million posts because that guy is made of stuff that's not even on this earth, you know, but it's just like, as long as you're moving yourself, you're good. So there's a bunch of guys I follow on Instagram. I don't know if you follow them. Uh, GBRS. So <clears throat> Global Battlefield Research Solutions. And they're a bunch of awesome guys. They're, uh, it's two retired Navy SEALs and a uh, retired British SAS operator. Bad dudes. Bad dudes. And they just emphasize the basics, man. Like they, 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 run a, they run a training company where, you know, they'll do, you know, firearms training and fitness training and this and that. But they go over, you know what they do every, they, you know what they do three times a day? They go for a 20 minute walk with each other. This isn't like, yo, we're bonding over, you know, a ma- you know, doing a marathon every two days. You know, they, they all wake up together. They get a cup of coffee. They go for a 20 minute walk and they and they talk about how important it is to get out, get fresh air, to get air and, you know, to get air in your lungs, just to walk, to open up this, to open up that. They have a stretching and mobility guy. They go over all these different stretch and I've followed his name is Vernon Griffin, Griffin Griffith, something like that. He is huge. He's been huge with my with 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 me lately because I've been slacking. I keep saying I want to get more, you know, back into yoga because yoga keeps you loose and limber. Yeah. Um, I got to re-download the pliability. Oh, app. Pliability dude. is the app that I was using for a while. I for, need I need that for constant stretches. Mm-hmm. I just I, I I get I get like uh, I don't know I get weird because I want to do it at night before bed or in the morning right when I wake up and I'm just like oh, I don't feel like laying on the floor. I'm cold. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm 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 stiff right now and obviously that, that's what's there. It's there to help you. It's yeah. There to help you get you it's, more limber. And, and this guy he goes over all these like basic functionality movements and like I follow his routines to like the T now. Like my stretching. I I would do like five minutes and then I would like pull a hamstring or hurt this or hurt that. And I'm like, oh, I should probably stretch out more. And then my stretching went from five minutes to 10 minutes and 10 minutes to 15 minutes. And I started getting more and more loose. And don't get me wrong. I'm still stiff as a board, you know, but I'm not getting as hurt as I did before because like I would be like, all right, warm up for two minutes. Bam, let me go sprint a mile. And next thing I know, you know, my right calf is on fire. And I'm like, why is my calf on fire? And then I would like look at some of his stuff and be like, oh, this is how you stretch out your calves. This is how you loosen up your hips. You know, and these guys, they just, you know, and and then after that, they go over, like, they have, like, an online workout program, they have a shooting program, et cetera, so on and so forth. But they're not even all about, like, complicated stuff, man. And these are guys who... It doesn't have to be complicated. Complicating things sometimes just creates more of a headache for us to do it. The, just, and it's not even worth it. Yeah. Like, simple stuff works. These, it always has. That's why it's the simple stuff. These are guys that did 50 plus years in special operations and they're just telling you to go for a 20 minute walk a day. So, let's, take you know, like, like, let's just take it like this. <laughs> fundamentals of jujitsu work, be, not, be, you know, not because they're, oh, it's the fun, it, because of the fundamental, they're the building blocks of everything else. Yes. So it's like, you know, you're going to be able to get all that shit done and, and it's more effective than if you try to doing some fancy shit that doesn't actually do anything. Oh yeah, like what do you 
do you, what do you think I'm going to go for, you know, if, if I ever got into a fight, you think I'm going to go for like an Omo plot or something? Hell no. Um, a, those, did, <laughs> made up words out. That's a made up word. Omo, pl- Omo Plata, Go Go Plata, anything that ends just with sit, Plata, just ask him and just, and just hit him on the head while you have yeah. a Yeah, like, like, you feel like, you know, like, I would only, you know, like complicated moves like that, they're not needed unless the opportunity arises. Yeah. You know, they always teach you, like, for example, you know, the triangle choke, right? triangles what am i am i if someone's on top of me am i going to constantly try to pull someone's arm in so i could triangle them no. no i'm only going to go for a triangle if someone's trying to wail on me and i have their arm conveniently in my control you know but if someone's on top of me you know i'm just going to try to get out if you're going to try to wail on me yeah i'm good you know i guess out while, while he misses every yeah shot. but like, if, hey, I, if, hey. if 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 i have your arm then, then then it's something you could go for but it's not like i'm just going to be like oh i need the triangle i need to almost plot a go go plot of this that the whole nine you know the basics work you know if it, you know if like you said gassing someone out letting them you know like you know yeah, yo, dude i do that now so good <sighs> What so, let, let, just just laying on bottom and just let, just letting them guess? Uh, yeah, I hold people in my guard because I got the strong bodybuilder. Of course, yeah. I just hold people in my guard and I just and I, they'll be struggling. Mm-hmm. They'll stand up. I'll go for a dummy sweep. They'll sit back down. I'll be like, "Do you see how crazy you're moving right now?" I'm like, "Do you see how relaxed I am?" Yeah, I'm chilling. Yeah, I go, yo, you you can keep going. I'm, yeah, I'm I'm very relaxed right now. I'm just I'm just. Hanging out. Yep. Yeah. Well, Tyler and I, as we say all the time, just hanging out, man. So, so, so the good news was in when I got to the UFC gym, um, uh, or not even actually the UFC gym. When I was get overseas and I was rolling with these guys, and I guess it was to my advantage because I, for the first time, I knew more than them. But these were kind of guys that were like two twenty five, two fifty. These were big dudes, and I, I mean, I gained a little bit of muscle when I joined. I was, I don't know, maybe. 170 at the time, you know, like I, I was definitely, I, I, I got a little bit more meat on me, but they were on top, but they were just panicking, you know, like, you know, they, they're going for shoulder locks and I'd be like, nope, not, not doing that. Oh, I'm going to do this, you know, and I would just, you know, they, and they would do the dirty forearm where they would just yeah. grind it across your Plus face, you know, and it, yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, and it's making me so uncomfortable because you're just like, you know, like, it, like, and there was one guy that I, I tapped from it because he had this forearm that was yeah, just like out to here and, and like, i was just okay, like yeah this hurts yeah yeah, yeah i'm good you <laughs> can't take anymore yeah i was like i'm good here but like I had, a, I had a fucking purple belt this morning super nice guy really great a dude he was trying so hard to get for the first couple seconds yeah he was trying so hard to get an arm bar from me and i was just like my grips are very strong. I was like, so you, was, you were on bottom. I was on bottom. Oh, okay, okay. So I literally just anytime I feel like an arm bar is coming, I grab my, especially if I'm in gi. Was it? I, was it a gi class? Yeah. See, but yeah, I exactly. Yeah. Own, I grab my own gi and then I kind of like twist my arm like this, and I kind of just, dude, I'm anchored. You're not. I don't care if you put a foot in there. I'm yep. so tight right here that you're just not. You're not going to be able to get through it. And and that's and what, he, dude. He was lacing it through for a little while. He was trying. He was trying. And then he realized that he wasn't going to get it, so he let go. And then I turned into him. So I was like, okay, oh, next next thing. Th- th- there there were people. Th- there were people when I was in gi that would get me in arm bars without even touching my arm. They would just pull my cufflink and just yank it in, and I'm like, I'm gone. And then, you know, like and, yeah. And all they gotta do is go like this. Yep. Like, okay. I'm yeah, and I'm trying to get out. They are not. They don't have a single hand on my arm, and all it took was two grips pulling. But that goes back into the, you know. Real life, you know, grips, no grips, gi, no gi, et cetera, so on and so forth. But it it just basics work, man. You basics know, work. The, 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 the basics work. And at the end of the day, are you going to get into a fight with someone that knows more than you? There is a chance that you could, but there is a higher probability that if something happens and you're squaring up with a guy and he's just staring at you in the eyes, then you could just chop him down like a tree to the legs. And hypothetically, if it gets messy and it goes to the ground, you know what to do. You know, yeah, you just know concrete it. hurts, you know, oh, concrete hurts. You know? Takedowns today, and I yeah. said to my partner, I said, dude, this takedown would be horrible. On yeah. Knees, man. Oh, my it, God. It would be, oh, I, my knee would blow out right you, there. You, and I just, like, I just, I'd have to lay down and pretend to, pretend to be dead like one of those goats. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It's, especially like what, what, when you watch like competition, you know, and I get like, you know, wrestling is holding, but like, do you think I'm going to shoot a double leg on concrete? My knee is going to get shredded to bits if I do that. Especially in shorts. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's over, man. Yeah, Baby you, you know, jeans, you, got little, little something, you know, I, I would I would rather take my chances in a clinch and go from like a for like a leg sweep or something. Yes. But, but, but but like or try to go hip to hip or something like that. Legs but out. if you think that I'm going to shoot for a double leg <laughs> in normal clothes, you got yeah. to, no way is that happening. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to hurt myself more than I hurt you. <laughs> yeah, no. No, no, I'm good. I'm skipping that one. Yeah, I'm so that lesson. Ab- absolutely, absolutely not. What else? What else did I have? So here? actually, I wanted to. I wanted to back up. I wanted to you ask got? you about the military. Ah, 
I wanted to ask you about the military and just like what got you into it? What, what How did you get involved? Was mm-hmm. it something that you always wanted to do? And then obviously your time in South Korea, like my my buddy um, Daquan, he came on a long time ago. Yeah. And he was in the Air Force and he was talking about soju and all this <sighs> stuff. Oh, yeah, I knew that. You fucking military guys. You guys are crazy motherfuckers. Soju, man. That was, uh, yeah, th- was, that, was that was that was the that was the uh, the poison. Yeah, he was talking about <laughs> soju and just like the life over there. And I'm just curious what, what your experiences were. Oh, man. Wow. I guess I could be here forever talking about this. So, um... So the military, right? So I was in high school and I started seeing ads for stuff. And I didn't know at the time I was like, you know, I, I was like kind of like every other kid in high school, you know, you're kind of undecided. You don't know what you want to do. There are very few that who are like, oh, I'm going to do this. And they go out and do it. And props to them when they do. I still don't know what I want to do. You watch <laughs> Exactly. You know, so just, you get Thirty-two years old. I still don't know. I, no, you got it going on. Man, look at this. Doing yeah, stuff, but exactly. Yeah. No, it's all right. Um, so I was like, all right, I'm. You know, like I still don't know what I want to do. This that. So I graduated, and I went to my parents, and I told them I was thinking about the military, and I talked to a friend of mine who was in, and he was like, listen, man, he was like, you can't join the military half-ass. Like, you know, like now you can go active duty. Be overseas, do what you got to do, you know, or like if you just want to do boot camp and do your training and then just jump right into the reserves, then you could do that as well. But, you know, the military is a pretty big investment because then, you know, you, you owe the government your body for a couple of years. Yeah, you're in, you're in. So I was like, you know what? Let me get some more time to think about it. So I went to Nassau Community College and just to, you know, get a little bit of education under my belt. And uh, I graduated and this was 20, 2013. I graduated in December of 2013 and revisited the conversation with my parents. You know, they were like, you know, what do you want to do? And, I, you know, like, are you going to go to school from here, this, that? And at the time, I mean, listen, we all know, like, you know, college is stupid amounts of money. Stupid uh, amounts of money. My, my mother <laughs> yeah. hates when I say that I don't believe yeah. that Quinnipiac was worth the money. Yeah. No, and every and, single time. I did two years at Nassau, yep. which was a great, Love Nassau. great idea. Nassau was awesome. <laughs> two years at Nassau, and then I was doing two years at another college. Yeah. And truthfully, with the amount of money I spent at Quinnipiac, sick. I should have just went to like University of Hawaii it's or somewhere sickening. fucking fun yeah. and warm. Yep. Instead, I chose depressing Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah, I just I I don't and you know now the there there's a a a, a rebuttal from the world saying oh well yeah actually you probably don't need a college degree for you know a lot of these different things and yes and no depends on it depends on the field you want to well, go I to mean, obviously yeah college degree for a fucking doctor yeah. but I'm saying for most of these careers that they're saying mm-hmm. they're saying oh well you know what now we're we're not really looking that much into the college degree as like the end all be all. And I agree with that because there's Absolutely. a lot of people that are way smarter and way more in in the actual dirt of work mm-hmm. and actually getting their fingernails dirty and oh, actually yeah. doing things. Trade work. Without, exactly. Well, that and so I'm saying, you I'm know? not even saying I, I, I physically dirty, but I'm saying there's somebody that could have been, let's say, a photographer and a cinematographer. Yeah. And they've worked on indie sets and they've done a lot of things just by networking and they never went to film school. Yeah. But they're more qualified than the dude that's in a four-year film school because the dude that, oh, well, he's learning about the abstract look of this artist and this and that. The other dude was doing it. Yeah. He was just doing shit. So there, there's some things to be said about an actual college degree. And if it actually is mandatory for $52,000 a year is what Quinnipiac was. I only went for two years. Oh and that was God. two years too long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was two years too long. And I agree, you know, like- Car payment every month. Oh, yeah. It's disgusting. Loans. Disgusting. It's insane. Disgusting, you know? And then, you, you like, college can benefit some people, you know? It's, it's not like you have to completely rule it out. But, like, my dad was a local three electrician in the city. And, you know, he got in and did great, you know? Had a great career. Has, you know, retired, lives in Florida, has a great pension. You know, a lot of people, especially in this day and age, you know, like- when I was growing up, I'm 30, but like when I was growing up, not many people were talking about trades, you know, or like, oh, well, you don't want to be a plumber. You don't have to deal with this. You don't want to be an electrician. You want to do this. I'm like, and then I came and I actually worked with my dad for two summers before I joined. I was a, I was a summer apprentice for Local 3. I'm coming to find out that journeyman plumbers in Local 1 were making like $92 an hour. Yeah. You know? And and, and, and guess what? When, they, when the day is insane. done, the day is done. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. You're not on call. You punch your hours and you go home, yeah. you know? Oh, you want some overtime here? You know, you like get to this enjoy and that. Your, 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 your not, you're not just creating a career. This is the big thing that I'm learning now. You're not just creating a career. You're creating a life. Yep. Yep. That's the big thing. Exactly. So, so I graduated Nassau and I still was kind of unsure with what I wanted to do, but I wanted a challenge. You know, I was... 
I was the skinny kid in high school that didn't do any sports, you know, like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't on the football team. I wasn't doing this. I wasn't doing that. I was just another, you know, schmo walk in the hallway. I was in, I was involved in music at the time, you know, my other hobby, which is drumming, you know, that was, that, 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 that I started drumming when I was a Sample kid. Sample drums. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to that. Um, but I was like, you know, I'm just another guy here. And then like, I just like. I was like, you know what? I, I got something to prove to myself. Like, I want to go challenge myself. I've never challenged myself before. I never went out for sports in high school. I never did this. I never did that. And then I kind of told my parents, like, hey, like, I think I want to do this. You know, um, I, I, I came from uh, a pretty simple background. You know, my parents got divorced when I was four. I didn't have any siblings. So I didn't really have like an anchor at home. Like, yeah, like I love my mom. I love my dad. But it was just like, I wasn't anchored to anything. You know, I was like, I wasn't in a, a, a you know relationship at the time. And I'm like, all right, I might as well go for it. You know, like, well, I, this was after, you know, the Nassau and everything, you know, I was like, I might as well go for it. And, um, I joined the Navy in 2014. Uh, I decided to go active. <laughs> it's so funny too, because I didn't know what branch I wanted to join. So my dad went with me to all the different recruiters and I went to the Marines and I was like, what did each one promise? You? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> promise you. Well, the, promise well, you the Hellcat. Well, 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 the, well the, I went to the Marines in the army and I looked at the Marine jobs and I was like, eh, I don't know about all that. And then I went to the army and then they were like, well, you could do this, you could do that, whatever, so on and so forth. And then I was stupid. If I knew now I knew that, I would have joined the Air Force. But <laughs> yeah, the Air Force is cushy, they, 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 they got steak and lobster every day for dinner. Um, but so I looked at the Navy and it said, you know, what, what, at the time it was join the Navy, see the world, right? And um, I was like, you know what? Maybe, maybe the Navy will work for me. We'll try this out. And then, you know, I took my ASVAB and I got my scores and I was like, he's like, oh, well, you know, you could be an MP and we do this and we do that. You know, recruiters, they, they, they sell you, you know, and uh I was like, sure, yeah, I'll be an MP. This will be cool. You know, maybe it'll apply to something when I get out as opposed to just sitting on a computer and doing this and doing that the whole nine. So I joined up. Uh, my first duty station was, uh, yeah, South Korea, 2014, 2016. South Korea, my first couple months there were rough because I missed home a lot. You know, I finally realized, like, I wasn't, I wasn't stationed in the States. I was st stationed halfway across the world. North Korea at the time, you know, Kim Jong Un, he was, you know, lighting off, you know, They're like doing shit. Yeah. So like, so like, so like, it was, it was, it was kind of like, we had going to be wrong. Obviously, we had a ton of free time to go out and do this and do that. But like, whenever he was like testing like bombs in the ocean, like they would come out with like orders for us saying like, oh, be aware of this, be aware of that. And you're like, oh wow, okay. So this is kind of like whatever. So, but it was really cool because my dad came out to visit me for Christmas that year. We had a good time. This that. Um, but Korea was awesome. Korea. Christmas in, Christmas in Korea. Huh? Christmas in Korea. Well, I mean, I. I I didn't come home for a single holiday in my four years active. Why? So I spent my time coming home in the summer. You know, well, also, actually, it wasn't even just that. More of the senior guys were allowed leave in, like, the big holidays, you know, and I, since I was a junior guy, it was kind of like earning your stripes. Like, so if I had, like, a 11 or 12-year guy saying, like, oh, well, I'm going home, I'm going home, you know, and then I'm like, hi, little... Little Gunnison, you know, little, little 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 petty officer, third class Gunnison wants to go home. It's like, oh well, we're already filled up for Christmas leave block, so you got to stay here. Sucks to suck, rookie. You know, like like one of those deals. You know, so I was like, was okay. it bad staying there? No, no, it wasn't. Uh, you know, like I said, it was only like the first couple months that kind of were rough from missing home, and then like I kind of just got used to it. You know, and I I lived a pretty normal life there. You know, luckily. Um, you know, Korea really wasn't bad. You know, I was doing base security there, and it was just you know we stood we stood gate and you know controlled the en entry points. Nothing really happened. Um, driving around, I think I pulled over maybe like three. It was a very small, quiet base. There was We had a population of maybe like 140, 150 people. Long days, though. That's what... I had a very easy job, and the hardest part about my job was not falling asleep because I was up... We work five to five, but you had to be at work at four, which means you had to be up at 3.30 because you had to be at work at four. You have to arm up. You have to go over what you're going on for the day. And these days on gate, like, you know, you're on the gate and it's not hard, but you're like, you're standing there in full gear, you know, you, you have your vest on, you have your belt, your gun, your cuffs, your mags, you know, your, your baton, your flashlight, and you're just standing there for eight to 12 hours a day. The nighttime and, would probably be the hardest. The, oh, the nighttime was worse because like, I, I would hear my own thoughts in my head, yeah, you know. Yeah, midnight like, to five. Yeah. Midnight to five. You know, like, <clears throat> oh yeah, you know, I would stand out there and like, you're, you're with, I was with the Korean guards too and I missed those guys. They were good guys. Like we would talk and stuff. But that's all you could do is talk. You can't have your phone. You can't be distracted. You know, there's cameras all around you, you so, know? So, truthfully, in, in a lot of ways, that's actually really good for your brain. It was. For your mind. Because it's actually a, a, the time that you probably... It was probably some of the only time that you've had actual downtime. Oh, yeah, you know? Even though you're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is downtime it, for your brain. It, it's down, but then, like, you just kind of feel you're just like i'm staring into the street for six hours you know and i'm like man what is going on out here you know so it's like i helped a buddy with construction one time and, and he you just watched paint dry we were, <laughs> we were flagging yeah in the city oh, okay like on the side yeah side of the yeah, road yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Like, moving cars and, and you're whatnot. just and i'll tell you what man that was the worst that we did we we did uh 20 hours or something like that 
And I'll, pff, bro, when I, you stand still and you just let your body lock up, it's the worst. Yeah, so, and it was cold. Yeah. I, I was, oh I was, yeah. I was looking around and I and and the thing that fucking pissed me off about it, fucking Petey, the thing that pissed me <laughs> off about it was he went into his car and took a nap for an hour and a half. Mm. I was outside. So then when I when it was my turn, he's like, "Yo, you could take a nap after me." Okay, cool. Yeah. He gets out. Because the boss comes onto the site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're outside, this and that. And then the boss decides to stay. And PG goes, oh, yeah, you can't go in the car and, and nap now. And I'm yeah, just What like, the hell you mean I can't? Okay, <laughs> yeah. so now yeah. I'm just here. And I was on another corner away from him yep. for a while. And then there was nothing, nothing going on. Yep. And so I definitely understand what you mean when it's- Oh, it was, it, it was, that was, that was the hardest part about it. But like, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but South Korea is one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. Yeah. When I tell you this- so they well, I, I went to Seoul twice. So okay. the, the DMZ is up there. I went out there. Actually, my first UFC event was UFC Seoul when Ben Henderson fought um, uh, Korean Zombie. I think was the main event. Yeah, it was like a whole bunch of Korean fighters, and then Benson Henderson was on that, and all this stuff. So me and my buddies, I, I, two of us took leave, and then we all went up there. But like we stayed the night. We got to go out. This it was, it was awesome. But every single place you go had Wi-Fi. And the Wi-Fi there is faster than any Wi-Fi I've ever been on in my life. Even in the States now, that South Korean Wi-Fi was lightning quick. And I wonder how fast they're running. I, I don't know. But all I know is that they had the best internet I've ever had in my life. I got a PlayStation, you know, like whenever me and my buddies would play, like, you know, we would sit in our barracks and play PlayStation and just like pound endless, you know, Bud Lights and stuff like that. Um, but South Korea, it was, it, it, and South Korea was a party, man. You know, like the nightlife out there was awesome. You know, we would go to, you know, a town or two over and go out and party. You know, soju, you know, nectar of the gods. <laughs> it, you pay I mean here it's different because of import tax but like we were paying like we go to the corner store pay like a dollar dollar twenty for like three bottles of soju and then I'd go to Busan and Busan is a huge huge party city very very industrialized there we would take the bus there the bus is like an hour it's, it's like an hour long I would have like three bottles of soju not know who I was by the time I got there and I spent six bucks yeah. you know it was awesome so um, South Korea was a good staple um, I got to do what was the food Food is great. I don't, you, you have a Korean barbecue? I've not had Korean barbecue. I've had, I have a lot of Korean friends, and I have not had Korean barbecue. If you ever want to smash some Korean barbecue, you call me because you know good places. In, no, I don't. I actually have never been to Korean barbecue here because of how overpriced it is. Now, I would go though, but I haven't found enough people to like want to go with me. Oh, but no, like bro. you go, you do the bulgogi, everything on the table. I'll definitely spend some money on that. But like, yeah, we would go to places. And like we would tip them, so they would hook us up. So it's like you know, like they would give us like three yeah, bottles culture, for one. Tipping yeah, tipping culture only. Seems yeah, to be you know, and then you, know, you owe them five hundred percent. Exactly. Of so 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 if like the bill was like eighty bucks, we would give them like hundred thirty. You know, because we're all tipping out like ten here, twenty here. You know, and then like the next time around, they're giving us all this extra food. They're giving yeah. us extra soju. It was, it was a great place. I I don't know if not many people know this. I got LASIK there. And I got LASIK there. And the the thing was is I so I I wore glasses my whole life. And my buddy's wife went out in town there and got LASIK. And she was like, it's great. This, that, the whole nine. I applied for LASIK through the Navy. But since I wasn't considered in like a, a condition one combat zone, I wasn't like essential. So they put me at like, I don't know, tier three, condition three. And I had to wait like three years or whatever the case was. So I did my own research and I found the place into town and I bought it to my command. And I was like, hey, like, you know, can I get it out in town? I know it's not through the military. And they're like, you can. But, you know, so I sat down with the commanding officer and he was like, these are the stipulations. Like you have to pay for it. We're not going to give you medical leave for it. You have to take your vacation leave if you know to, to recover, and uh, and 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 that was and, and that was pretty much it. Like you're accepting the risks of what you're doing. You know, now, this is a place that had great reviews. Not a single this out the whole nine. And I went in and I went for the test. I qualified for it, and the CEO signed up. He's like, "You sure you want to do this?" I said, "Yeah, it's fine." I got LASIK there. Oh, the first five minutes. I don't know if you know. You got LASIK? You know anyone with LASIK? So uh, as you're saying that, I'm sitting here with you just slightly out of focus because I need to be wearing my glasses. Oh, okay. And I, I, <laughs> for some reason, I don't like wearing my glasses. I don't like the feeling of everything being blurry and then this is like tack sharp. Yeah. It freaks me out a little bit. I was I've been having, and I used to, I guess as my vision is becoming more poor due yeah. to not only aging, but looking at screens all the time and whatnot. I'm finding there. It's. I used to love wearing my glasses yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm finding it harder and harder to want to wear them for prolonged periods of time because it de generally does feel very strange to me as my pres as my prescription is getting stronger. Oh yeah. Well, mine got worse and worse and worse. And this was when I really started to like dive into fitness because it was just a military culture, you know, working out and this and that. And I'd be running and my glasses would be bouncing up and down. I was like, I can't do this anymore, you know. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try because contacts were burning my eyes. So I couldn't do glasses anymore. I've never tried. Contacts. So I tried them twice, and I and I. Mean, 
mean, contacts do burn your eyes at first. That's kind of the point. I just hated it. And I was like, you know what? Let me try this whole LASIK thing, you know? And the first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be real with you. It takes about 10 minutes. It's like five minutes each eye. The first five minutes were probably the scariest five minutes of my life. I know. I've heard. Please, please list it down for people that don't. Okay. Care. So, and, and I'm just going to be, br- I'm, I'm going to be squirming I'm, when you're talking about I'm, this. I'm going to be brutal. I'm going to be brutally honest here. <sighs> it doesn't hurt. It just, so this is what they do. They put a clamp in that holds your eye open. I hate that. Then they put eye drops in. So you don't, it's like, it's a numbing, it's like a numbing eye drop. So you don't feel pain. I felt no pain. I want to say I felt no pain during this. I felt zero pain, but the problem is, is that you have this clamp and they tell you if you look away, it's going to screw your eye up. So you have to watch your eye get taken apart. They take the top layer off. They laser into it. They got to do, put it back on and you are watching all of it happen. You are staring into this laser. You smell the burning because they're, you know, doing whatever the hell they got to do. It doesn't hurt. It does not hurt a single bit. It is just the scare. Mind fuck. It is, it is the biggest mind fuck. to sleep, bro. Uh, they can't do that because when you sleep, your eyes go to the back of your head and you have to stare. And they literally tell me, they told you over and over again, if you look away, this is going to hurt. This is going to, you're not going to be able to see out of your eye. It's going to. Oh, don't, don't fuck me up like that. So Ugh. it's listen, it's it. I I I was hyperventilating for the first bit of it. They stopped. I said, all right, you know, let's go back into it. And then after that, they did my left eye, no problems. But that my right eye, that that for, that five minutes was it felt like an hour, Ugh. and it was terrifying. But they did my left eye. I calmed down. They did my. I was like, oh, okay, well, never mind. That really wasn't so bad as long as I look forward, right? So. And then after they tape you up, you know, they t- then my buddy took me out. He helped me. Um, uh, my, my roommate at the time, Gabe Murray, shout out Gabe Murray. I miss that guy. Um, shout out to the homie. Yeah, shout out, shout out to the homie. I hope he's doing well. Um, he helped tape up the windows that we had in our barracks. So we put like cardboard over them and blackened them out and stuff like that. Yeah, and light, light is tough. So the first couple of days are pretty tough. Yeah, uh, I healed generally quick though. I, I think I was only so I took I think ten days or eleven days of leave. And I was back at work after like the fifth or sixth day. So were you able to get those other days back? From so your- uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, nice. so, so I was able to, I was able to cancel my leave early, and I got those five days back because, I, well, I told them, I, 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 this is what I said. I said, hey, I was like, it was the first two or three days I couldn't really see, but then like, then they tell you to gradually introduce light. So then I would put sunglasses on and then turn a light on here and turn a light on here, you know, and then it got to a point where like I went outside at night with sunglasses on and I was sitting there, or I was walking around and then like I would take my sunglasses off at night and I would just kind of look at street lights and it was a little bright, you know, and I kind of just told him, I'm like, Hey, like I can come back. But I was like, if a room is super, super light, you know, I'm going to have to put sunglasses on, I'll, you know, I'll keep sunglasses on inside, but like, I can see, you know, like this put them on night duty. Boom. Yeah. No, no, no. Stamp on. No, I, well, I, I, I'm trying to remember. I think we were on nights at the yeah. time and, and I think it did work out like that, but like in our like dispatch area, we had lights on and stuff and they were like, yeah, we don't care if you're, you know, it is what it is. You got to wear sunglasses. So, and, but then after that, I mean, it was just, and then just gradually got better and better, but my eyes are still a little bit more sensitive. I put eye drops in every morning, like, cause they dry out a little bit. Um, you know, I wear sunglasses in most places that more people don't, you know, like if only like a, a shred of light is coming through, I'll put sunglasses on just cause they're sensitive, but night and day, man, you know, yeah. I'm able to see now, um, you know, I'm knock on wood. I'm, I think I'm, you know, I'm still a 2020. Um, so anywho, so Korea, I've, yeah, I've had floaters in my eyes for a long time. So listen, but in the States now it's like, I don't know, seven grand or something like that. Is that, is that expensive or it's, cheap? It's, I paid 1300 for both of my eyes and then the medical yeah, eye drops. That, that, after. See, that seems to be pennies to the dollar. Yeah, that seems to be most procedures. In pennies the to States. the dollar. Well, that's what I'm saying is like, so they are so advanced and so ahead because, and this was 2016 at the time. It's probably LASIK here is probably still even more And there. You're paying just over a grand for it, you know, and it's, and it's 7,000. I, w- I want to say, I, I think roughly a LASIK, but it also depends on how bad your eyes are. But I think the average is like six or 7,000. Yeah. So go ahead and enlighten me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> yeah. If you just search what the average LASIK procedure is in the United States. Uh, LASIK, on average, LASIK costs between uh, $2,000 per eye to $4,000 or more per eye. Per eye. That's so what that's- they're saying. But then there was an ad... Uh, up top, four thousand. So that's four thousand, eight thousand, depending on. It was an ad up top. LASIK Garden City, highest rated LASIK clinic. We've made premium LASIK more affordable. Three thousand for both eyes for a limited time. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah, that's not bad. But still, but regardless, twenty sixteen, I paid twelve hundred dollars for for twelve thirteen hundred dollars for both eyes. It was great. 
So South Korea was cool. Um, I had a lot of fun there. You know, like I said, the work wasn't. I want to visit South Korea. It was. It was. It was. It was a, it was a great. Call. I, I definitely would recommend. You know, not many people. You know, really know what goes on out there. And then like from there. Um, I went to Japan for a week. Japan was cool. So jealous. Uh, about that, man. I, I, well, I didn't get to do much there. I was only there for a week, um, but I was on like temporary de- uh, duty there. We had to do like, it was like a, some sort of intoxilizer thing that we were doing for like road stops. Um, I did they, they, they drinking and driving out there. Well, no, we were getting trained on the new intoxilizer oh, okay. that we had to administer in case, you know, there was suspicion of DUI or anything like that. So then my two years were up and then I ended up scoring a really good deal. I was supposed to go to an aircraft carrier after. I was supposed to go to the USS Nimitz out of Washington at the time. This was 2016. Is that the dream or? No, it was not the dream. I, I, I was applying for other over, uh, overseas duty stations and I was getting shot down for all of them. But the order writing system like crashed and like 5,000 people lost their orders. And I was supposed to leave Korea in like three weeks and I didn't have orders. And I'm like, uh, what's going on here? So I talked to the detailer and I ended up scoring really good orders to this really small naval base in a town called Gaeta, which is in Italy. And it's a little uh, harbor security command, so little tiny boats driving around and stuff. The USS Mount Whitney was there, so we were doing port security for them. And when I tell you that 2016 to 2018 in Italy were the best years of my life, they were the best years of my life. I loved Italy, man. My workload was not too heavy. You know, we did boat maintenance. We drove around, but like it was never anything crazy because like, you know, when the Mount Whitney was in, we didn't, we only didn't really have to deal with them, but like it was a small command. There was no barracks. So I had an apartment out in town, Um, you know, on the weekends that we were off, as long as we were in good behavior, we were able to go pretty much anywhere in the European Union for the three days that we were off and we didn't have to take vacation. We just had to like pretty much ask for a request to go. Me and my buddies, we saw like, oh my God, I want to say it was like 13 or 14 countries. I've been to Austria. I've been to, I don't even want to start where I've been to. Um, Europe was beautiful, man. I don't know how much of Europe you've seen, but Europe I've was. Done, I've done, um, I've done Switzerland, Italy, France, Germany. Uh, did a little Greece. Great, Greece was the a little Greece, most but beautiful I was, water I was I've young, ever so I don't really remember <laughs> it. Spain too. Spain, I don't really remember too much of. Been to Spain. Spain was cool. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it, Italy. So I guess the Navy poster wasn't lying. So, so I, I did see the world. Yeah. So when I, when I got off initial active duty in 2018, I think I had like 20 countries under my belt or it was like seven, it was like 18 or 19 20, uh, countries under my belt. And I, uh, I got out because I was, I wanted to go reserves. Well, after, I'm sorry, after that, oh, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. They said that if I wanted to stay in, they were going to send me to Nebraska to like an air force base and the work there wasn't that good. I didn't think it was going to be rewarding to my career. So I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm going to still keep my uniform. I'm going to go into the reserves, but I'm going to go home, go to school, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I came home, I went to school for a year, but then, um, I signed up for a deployment that I can't really talk about. It's kind of, well, well no, it's one of those things, but it, let, let, let's just say that, let's just say that the deployment was awesome. I saw more of the world. I got to shoot machine guns and this and that the whole nine. I got to train with a bunch of guys that were, you know, bad dudes. If you if, if, if you get what I mean, where were you when yeah. you killed Osama? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, like one of those things. So, um, I, you know, I, I got to wear normal clothes for seven months. I didn't have to wear a uniform. We were all on a first name basis. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was one of those things. Great time. Uh, I'll probably go back out with them in a couple years uh, when, when my time is up again. But um, the military has been great, man. And, and you know, it, it, it got me my bachelor's degree. It got me, you know, my foot in the door with a lot of things. It helped with, helped with you know what it did? Help with a lot of networking. And one of the things that I, you know, I got a recommendation letter from this guy. I reached out to this guy, this, that, the whole nine, especially because being in the reserves, there's always orders going on everywhere. Oh, you're here. Oh, hey, I'm trying to come out to where you are. Can you see if they have any like two or three month billets here, this, that, the whole nine. Um, and I met a lot of solid guys, like a lot of solid dudes. And one of the things that I actually always say is I have the biggest love hate relationship with social media, the biggest love hate relationship. I know you've talked about it on pretty much every single one of your podcasts. Get me started. I'm, I'm just going to say my two cents of why I'm grateful for it. I want, you to, I want you to. My two cents of why I'm grateful for it is because I joined the military at a time where Facebook was kicking off. Instagram wasn't hot until a couple years ago. But I still talk to guys that I... Now, it, is it simple enough to get someone's number and download WhatsApp and text them and this and that? Like, yeah, of course I could do that, you know, because everyone is in different parts of the world and WhatsApp is the most common, you know, texting app no matter where you are. Um, but 
I still talk to the like guys in Korea, like I'm in a group chat with them and I've been in a group chat with them since 2014. We play fantasy football every year. You know, some of us are, some of them are still in the military and deployed. Some of them are civilians. Some of them are civilian reservists like me. Like we are scattered all over and I'm going to talk to these guys till the day I die. You know, like we're going to play fantasy every year. We talk UFC. We all used to get together for UFC fights. So like when UFC events are going on, you know, it'll be like 5 p.m. in this guy's time zone. It's 1 a.m. here. I'm falling asleep, you know, this, that. And they're all great dudes, and we BS day and night. Some All my guys from Italy, you know, I still talk to them every now and then. Um, you know, so social media has, it's. I'm grateful for that because I'll see what they're doing on Facebook or what they're doing on Instagram. Some people post a lot, some people don't post at all, but like Facebook Messenger has been great. Instagram's been good, you know, like whatever the case is, it's awesome to see them doing this, doing that. So that, only, and I, I want to say for that reason and that reason only, is why I'm grateful for social media. I think social media is a disaster. Otherwise, obviously, I can't talk too much about it because I'm a guy that uses social media, not a lot, but a little bit. And But I'm just so happy to still talk to those dudes and I'm going to talk to them forever. And I hope like, you know, down the road, I'll run into them somewhere because when I got to, especially Korea, you know, I didn't know anyone there, you know, and I became close with a certain amount of people and then we'd go out, we'd party, we'd, do, we'd work, we'd do this, we'd do that. And... You know, it's one of those things where it's like after I left in 2016, it's like telling yourself like, wow, I came really close to these guys and I may never see them again, you know? And, um, you know, one of the things that sucked was uh, that guy Chris I was telling you about before who I worked with, he was an MP with me and uh, we were doing the jujitsu and the competitions together. I think about a year after I left, I got word that he passed away and I Still to this day, kind of don't know what happened. I, 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 there's something about a blood clot, but I don't know. And that's like, you always wish you could say more and do this, you know, and do that. And, and, you know, so I lost him a year after I was super close with him. Um, a guy I grew up with, uh, you know, God rest his soul, Chris and God rest, uh, my buddy TJ, who I went to Apple, who I worked at Applebee's with, he joined the Marines. He came back. He unfortunately took his life. Um, you know, he got out of the military. I guess he decided that the civilian world wasn't accepting of him and he didn't want to be here anymore. And it's just like, you know, I'm grateful for a lot in the military and the bonds that I've built and the friendships that I've had, but I've also lost a decent amount of people on the way too. And, um, you know, when I first, especially like, you know, with the guys that I did lose, you know, I started doing probably towards 2017, 2018, I started doing the Murph. And the Murph challenge was based on, you know, Michael Murphy, Operation Red Wings. We all know that. And I was grateful enough that the first year that I did it at OG, Evan and Taylor were just awesome about it. They didn't even do an event for it. Like Taylor was like, hey, I'm just going to come. You know, you guys can do it. And Taylor, it was me, this guy, Mike. Um, I don't know if you know him. He was uh, he's in uh, Brazil now. He's he's working with the feds. Um, but he was the dude that always had a vest on every class, huge, built like a truck. He had the, uh, the, the, the 75th Ranger Regiment tattoo on the back of his shoulder. Pro I probably if I showed up, yeah, yeah if, if I showed you a picture of him, you'd it's probably tough, like him. when I don't interact with people on a daily, I don't, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, the name quick. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so when, when, when that rolled around on April weekend, like they were like, Hey, like, you know, just come in at this time. And it was me, him and this girl, Diana, who's an NYPD cop. She's awesome people. And it was just the three of us. We came in, I wrote on the board, hey, this is what we're doing. And then I wrote for Chris, for TJ. And then, you know, and Taylor was there, you know, because obviously, you know, the, the, their gym and we just ripped and we yeah. and we just did it. And then what is was it? It's, it's every April, every, every April Memorial Day. It's, it's like Memorial Day weekend is when they do it, you know, and then that kind of like moved forward. And then like Evan made an event out of it, you know, like we, like it, like last year, you know, he told me he was like, hey, like, you know, this is it was I think I think it was supposed to fall on like a leg day. And he was like, Hey guys, we're doing the Murph today. Mm -hmm. He's like, this is what the workout is. And this is, what I was there doing. last year. I had exactly. A, I had, yeah. I had a, uh, a hurt, um, you, AC joints. So I couldn't do it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, listen, I, I've, I, you know, I, I try to do my best with it too. Now, you know, I, I can do it, but I can't do it as fast as I used to be able what, to do it. What is know? it running down again? It's that. so it's uh it's, it's a mile run. Okay. 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and then another mile run. Some squats, so, some do it with the vest, some do some do it without the vest. Um, and it's just like, it, you know, it's just one of those things. It's one of those things that every year, you know, I get to look back and think on like the times that I had with those guys and, and stuff like that. You know, they, 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 they contributed to all the fallen members of the military. Obviously, it was for Michael Murphy, who was out of, you know, uh, out of Ron Konkuma, um, actually died with an FDNY patch on for, for uh, I think it was his dad. That was, that was FDNY. 
um, you know, but it's like a, a commemorative for, you know, everyone that has passed away in the military. And when I would show up to do it, I would write on a piece of paper for Chris and, uh, for Chris and for TJ and like, you know, and my, my piece of paper just sat on the floor and no one touched it. You know, people would go buy it and look down because the, but I, I scotch taped that piece of paper to the floor and people would go buy it, this and that. And there was like two guys that would look at the piece of paper and then they would look back at me. Cause I mean, listen, I had a vest on, but you could tell I was military. I had my unit patch. I had this, I had that, you know, whatever. So they would, so they would, they would turn around and look at me and then like, you know, they gave me knuckles or whatever. I don't even remember who it was, but the guys just looked at me and they're like, yeah, that, that's it right there. So, but like. It started. It started with his passing, Murph. Murph. It's yeah. So it's it started. Why, what is what is the significance of the workout though? Is there a reason? That, that was his favorite workout. That was to his do. favorite workout. Yeah. Right? So I it's, figured yeah. it was either something that he did. No, yeah. So like so so when he so when he passed and Red Wings happened and Lone Survivor, I'm sure you a great book. Even you know, great book, great movie. Um, you know, they came back and they said like this was his favorite workout to do, and they made something out of it. So, but anywho, you know, it's just you know the military has been great with my mindset and it's developed me as a man and as a person. Um, you know, it's just, and it, it ha I have, a, I've had a lot of ups, I've had a lot of ups and a lot of downs, you know, and, and it's just like, I'm grateful for everything I've done, things that I continue to do, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, say, say I'm a hero, but you know, I, I've, I, I've seen a lot of the world. I've seen a lot of the world that a lot of people don't see. Yeah. And I'm not just talking, going to Europe, partying this, that, the whole nine. I've seen some things where. Again, like I, you know, they, I can't really talk about it, but the you, scourge but scourge of the earth. But there's there's certain countries that are just like legit war zones, mm -hmm. and people going back to I guess what the second or third point of politics and complaining about politics here and this is wrong with the United States and that's wrong with the United States. They don't understand like perspective. Like okay, this is what the problems are in the United States. We're working on. We might be working on them. We might not be working on them. But you guys need to understand something. Like. We are a powerhouse of the world. There is so much wrong with the Middle East. There's so much wrong with Asia. There's so there is a, there's there's stuff that's wrong with Europe. You know, like there's great countries out there that are awesome. Don't get me wrong, but like I've seen just like I go past some stuff or read about some stuff that will never be in the news. No one's ever gonna know about it. But like it's just like one of those things where I'm like, I can't believe people are complaining about this. Here. I have friends that are spec up guys. They, that, that they disappear, probably they disappear for a few months and then they come back and you're like, oh hey, what's up, man? How you been? They're like, crazy shit, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, what kind of crazy shit? Just oh, yeah, crazy I, shit. I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. At this point, I know. No, but to ask. I just go. The, but I, I'm glad you're good. Yeah. No, it's like you. Yeah, but it's it, it's not even just that. But if you were to ask them that too, like you know, do you feel people are ungrateful in America? A hundred percent. Well, I I, you I can, believe that <laughs> that has to do with a lot with uh, just reality. Yeah. Not no, not living in reality. I have I have a feeling that that has to do more so with the false realities that people believe. Oh yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, that that the only bubble they know I hate, is. Oh my god, I the, hate to use this fucking buzzword. The echo chamber. The, I hate that the, the, everyone the, uses that word. Someone used it and everyone uses it now. But the echo chamber of their life, or, or, of what they see on social media or the celebrities or this or that, and oh well, why isn't my life like that? I need to go to Art Basel and all these different stuff. It's just, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not living a good life if I don't get to go to the Formula One race in yeah. Vegas for thirty five hundred dollars a ticket. Yeah, like, nah, bro. Like, there's a lot that you got going on that you don't that you really don't understand and know about. All all you read and see is what's going on and what's wrong in America. Like, I mean, over the past couple of years, unfortunately, you know, we have, and I, I we're not going to dive into it, but like, but like we have, we have Israel and Gaza going on right now. We have, we have Russia and Ukraine, but like, I know there's, go. but, but no, but no, I'm going to leave no, it at no, that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to leave it at that. It's like, but, but that has the potential of growing full scale and there's so much going on over there, but then people are still waking up and complaining about what's going on in America. There are families getting shelled in the Middle East. There are families that wake up to gunfire. There are families, you know, there are wives and children that are being taken away from their husbands because their husbands are re being recalled to active duty to fight for their homeland, you know? And I'm not going to sit here, talk about sides or anything, but like they are in, there's so many places, and not even just that too. There are warlords and militias. You ever see um, uh, 13 Hours, the, the story of Benghazi? No. Put that on your list. Okay. Um, it's it, yeah, yeah. Th Thirteen hours. The story of Benghazi. That was about um, a CIA stronghold in Libya that was taken over by a local militia and uh, GRS, which was a bunch of retired spec ops guys. There was eight of them defending against like five hundred. Is this the one that Clinton left? Is that the one? Is that the Benghazi that I'm? Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I don't know nothing. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Truthfully, I don't. I don't. If you want to dive into it, truthfully, I know yeah. nothing about. You, you, it. I just you hear Benghazi, and then I hear. I think Clinton because that's all I hear. It was it, it, yeah. And I have no yeah, idea. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there was eight dudes defending a CIA stronghold. We lost. Uh, we lost two of them. We lost the ambassador. But then, like that's what I'm saying. Like there's all these militias going for power. Black Hawk Down. You know. Uh, you know the Desert Storm. That was. You know that was a mess within itself because we were sending all these army guys to go to the Middle East, trying to. You know, um, trying to maintain a stronghold. But local militias, local warlords. This, that, the whole nine. There's so much in history that happens that a lot of people don't know about because they just live in this bubble that is the United States and they don't. I get it. You don't want to worry about the problems of other people. You want to focus on yourself, but they're like, oh, the United States is wrong with this. Oh, the United States is wrong with that. Oh, we're doing this. We're doing that. Like this world is a mess. Would you, would you still, and obviously you have to have some type of a, some type of a tailored response due to the, your active role in the military. But yeah. Would you still f- consider the America to be a powerhouse of the, of the world? Yes. Because well, this day? I, I, I a hundred percent do. And I'll tell you why, because we have all these bases and outposts in every other country. There's, I was in a naval base in South Korea. Does South Korea have a naval base in the United States? You hear about, no. you, hear, <laughs> you, you know, you, but you hear about, uh, you know, all these different things with like China having now oh, yeah. police forces, like little things in the U S as like hubs and whatnot. It's, but it's not a full blown military base. We have bases everywhere around the world and sketchy. we are, and we are the only country that has bases all over the world. Zacky guns. Sketchy, sketchy. So, but no, but that's uh, that's big government. Uh, you know, I'm I'm here to do my part and do what I got to do, whether I agree or disagree. I wear a uniform for a reason. There's a reason why I'm in. There's a reason why I haven't gotten out. And you know, truthfully, but, all of my friends that have gotten out, they say they wish they never did. They wish they had stayed. Well, every, that, everyone has different perspective. You know, every single some one. people, a lot of people that get out, it's because they disagree with what the government is doing. And I'm not saying I agree or disagree with everything that happens. And I'm not even saying that but, that's why they got out. There's the switch of career, whatever their reasoning for having left, whatever it is, it is. Yeah. But I'm saying the switching career going from military. Especially because I mean, what do most military guys turn to? They turn to cops. Exactly, because that's like the life that they know, at least in that form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on civilian type. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Land, but now you have them on that perspective, and they go, "Wow, I can't fucking stay. I wish I was still in the military." Everyone's different. Everyone's different, but it's just in in, in total, it's the military's taught me a lot. It has made me a pretty spot. Like, I don't want to say a pretty spot on person, but I'm very, I'm pretty attentive to detail. Like I said, I'm early to everything, you know, like, um, you know, that's one of the things that's forever in my head. I make my bed every single day, you know, and I make, you know, like I I used to make my bed a certain way. Now, you know, I just make it for the sake of, for, for it being made. But there's a lot of people that, you know, and, um, Admiral Bill McRaven, you know, he started that whole video of, you know, of the steps you take in a day to, you know, to make your day better and to be more productive. And it was, and the, the speech that he, made as the chancellor villa of the university of texas was you know as a navy seal for over 40 years the first thing you have to do when you wake up in the morning is make your bed it's not waking up and killing the bad guys it's waking up and making your bed and now it's doing this and it's doing that you know so he's he's a pretty good read too i don't know if you're a big reader but bill mcraven he i've become yeah. more uh more yeah more of a regular reader yeah so he's he, he's if, if you ever need a good read uh bill mcraven he's, he's he's got some pretty good books um but you know the military has a bunch of ups and downs for everyone, you know, and, and it's had more ups and downs for me. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for, for what I do and the perspective that it's given me, because if I didn't have the perspective on life now, if I didn't have it then, you know, like I, I feel like I would just be another person that lives in the bubble. That's the United States. And I'm not opening my mind to what's really happening around the world and seeing, you know, countries doing this and countries doing that and countries denying people of this and this and that, and all, you know, the, hundreds and thousands of innocent people that die that never make the news, you know? So the news only puts out there what they want you to know. So it's, um, it, it's, Isn't it, that sad? Isn't that sad? Well, a lot of people don't know that, you know? Well, yeah, they, they don't know that they're just being told what they feel like being, uh, what they want them to be told. I have seen That's so sad, many things that, thing. that no one will know, you know? Most and, people will never understand and, that and, and, the entire and time. That they will alive. never know. They're never going to understand. All they know is what they see on TV and how we're doing this and we're doing that, you know? And it's just... It is what it is. I'm not going to call them wrong for it. You know, like I, oh, it's scary. It, it is scary. It, it it definitely is. You know, and that's why and it's I, like when you start thinking in that terms. What do you think that we've else we've been told that just to be told and not actually told the full picture? Case in point. Yeah. So, but it's uh, 
it's been a good run, man. You know, I've been in 10 years. I plan on doing another 10 more. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll see until they kick me out. Uh, but it's, uh, you <laughs> know. What is, I was going to say, what is the progression now? Is no, just keep doing I'm, I, I'm, I'm still going, man. You know, uh, my, the, my my reserve unit supports uh, the command in Naples, Italy. So I'm grateful I get to go to Italy once wow. a year, have some bruschetta, have a little bit of wine. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I definitely want to get out and deploy again. Uh, maybe maybe in another couple of years, you know, try to get that under the belt. Uh, you where, know, I, Where do you want to go? Well, I want to. Uh, de it depends on where they need you. Well, yeah. So, so there's a couple places right now, but I want to get back to doing what I did before. The one that I can't, you know, really, really shake and talk about much. Uh, the other ones aren't really as interesting. You know, that one's kind of better for networking and career. And just I, like I said, I had you know a, a, a ton of fun. You know, out there, I was I was shooting a lot. I got to um, the, the the one the one thing I will say because I, I I think you know I was able to cross the equator. I got my shell back, so we got to I don't know. You know, the shell back is a big thing with the Navy. You know, so so that was super cool. Um, is that something I should ask you off camera? Well, we, we, no, the, the, well, the, the shellback is a Navy tradition where uh, it's like this, like, I can't talk about what it totally is, but it's like it's like a rite of passage for crossing the equator. Okay. And then, like, there's, like, you know, certain events that happen. It's, I don't want to call it hazing, but it's, like, it, 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 it's it's a lot of challenges and okay. stuff that happens. And it, it's 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 pretty funny. It's a lot of fun. So but you're on like, the other side of it now. Yeah. You, you, You've come out the other side oh, of it. Oh, it's great, though. But, like, I, I have. a new man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but like, I have, like, my I have my plaque. I want to get, ta uh, like, my tattoo. Like, I want to get tattooed, like, uh, the the coordinates of, of where, I got, where I crossed. You know, it's like a, it's like a Navy rite of passage thing. Like, you can't, I want to say it's like, you can't really say you're not in the Navy un, 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 until you, you get your shell back. But, like, a lot of people, like, kind of hold that. Like, oh, it's like, because I have friends that have never, I have friends that have never been on ships. And it's like, yeah, you got to get out there. You got you got you got to earn your way. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. there's they a lot of they don't just throw you on a ship right out. No, there. no, no, no. Well, I I did of uh, of uh, you know I I did four years on land in the Navy before I got out. And a lot of people do. It, it also depends on your job as well, you know. But like my job doing pulling security and stuff like that. Like we are a majority land based like. Uh, a majority land-based job. We're protecting bases, you know, we're, you know, we're standing the gates and this and that and the whole nine. Not saying it's the most exciting thing, but that's what the Navy asks out of us. But yeah, I mean, I have a ton of friends, myself included, you know, up until 2018. Like I, I never saw a ship until later, later on in my life, you know? So, but it's, uh, it's good on perspective and mindset, 100%. Um, you know, how, how long do we get to keep you here for right now? What do you mean? In, the, in New York. You've been here for a little oh, while. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, well, I, like, I, like I said, I drill here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right here. I'm actually on orders in the city right now with, uh, this, uh, with the state naval militia doing, um, you know, with the migrants. It's helped me to be a better leader. So, and, I, and I will say that. It's helped me be a better leader because I'm doing a lot of different tasks and, 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 and stuff like that. So... I can't really complain about that, especially because I have good military orders in this state. I get to come home every day. You know, it's not a combat zone. You know, I'm working, I'm working an eight hour shift and I'm coming home, you know? Yeah. So it's, um, it's, 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 you know, so. Have you been hitting OG? Uh, what? Have you been hitting OG? No, I, I've, I've been out of OG for a bit. Uh, I, I always tell Evan, um, you know, I'm, I'm the king of the injured reserve. Yeah. So, uh, I, so I left in December cause I was away with the Navy for a little bit and, um, when I when I was oh, when I was in Italy uh, I was I was in Italy I, I I threw my back out and I was like all right let me try to get better and then I did get better and I was like you know what I just kind of want to like preserve a little bit more like I'm I'm gonna go back I'm I'm definitely yeah, gonna you know I'm I'm gonna go back just right now I'm trying to you know trying to build up some more strength and avoid you know I've had little nicks in here my knee my you know my 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 calf this out the whole nine and I just want to focus more on my mobility and my recovering and and then when I'm healthy enough to go back because like I said oh geez. You know, it's it's an hour of just pedal to the metal. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's nice. It's nice to go in, get your shit done, just be. be yeah, yeah, done. yeah. You know, so it's uh, it's it's it, it's it's been great. Uh, you know, like a, I love I love OG. OG, it's 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 a good place. Just right now, I need to kind of focus on the recovery aspect of things. Yeah, so, I have to. So I'm the king of the injured reserve. I, I said that since day one. So yeah, dude, I have <laughs> I, I've always had herniated discs since I was like. 18 years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a bad car accident, and uh, I just I herniated L5 S1. Oof. And uh, it sucked for a long time. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even put my shoes on without being in pretty excruciating pain. But yeah. my, the guy that I worked with, the doctor, after I did my first bodybuilding prep with the bullshit guy, mm -hmm. uh, he had told me deadlift. And I looked at him like he was fucking nuts. I said, deadlift for yep. my back pain? Yep. He said, yeah, you need to build up strength down there and this and that. And he's told me to do sumo deadlifting because it'll build up more glute and yeah. more posterior. Yep, yep, I said, yep. okay, cool. Did it. Nope. Like, I mean, 
if I threw my back out, which happens every now and then, because you know it just happens even when you're young. We're at that age. <laughs> no, I was young. I was like yeah. I was early and late mid twenties. Oh, okay, still, okay. I'd still have like a, a, a you know throw my back out the wrong way, or I yanked a deadlift instead of just smoothly pulling it. Yeah, and uh, it got so much better. One day at OG last uh, last year, I forget when. It must have been during the summer. Tyler and I were working out together, and it was one where we were doing deadlift to like clean yep. press. And for some reason, dude, I just moved the wrong way. It was and boom. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't even heavy. Wasn't even my lower back. The I must have herniated a disc in the middle of my back. I, ever since, it's still every so often like certain. Movements, oh yeah. If my elbows are fully pinched back like that, I feel it. Super early in the morning, I feel it, and and it goes away. It doesn't hurt when I roll. It doesn't hurt anything, but you just know it's there. Yep. So ever since then, I'm just like, fuck, man. I really just wanted to keep the herniations to like those. I go to a chiropractor once a week. <laughs> you know, I yeah. got Derlin out in, in Smithtown. He yeah. works on Triple H. There you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah he works oh, on Triple the, H a couple times I'm a week to play for like, the game. Yeah, bro. <laughs> for years now, they've been, he's been working with him, and he's been on the podcast too, Derlin. He's fucking awesome. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I got to get better with the recovery. I, you've you've inspired me again to download the. Pliability app. Yeah. Pliability. I got to download that. Send the check. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to download that. But I feel like at this age, especially guys like us that push it, man, you know, I feel like at this age, it's about preserving yourself. We're not six days a week on top of OG, at least three to four. You got to, you got to, you got to preserve yourself. And like, especially if you're working out hard and you feel something click when you're going heavy, like ah, I might need to take it down a little bit today. You know, exactly. Yeah. Dude, I, it's very, it's very difficult yeah. for me sometimes when we're doing shoulder presses at OG. And I'm in a much different stage of training in my life. Not that I'm weak or anything oh, yeah. like that. I'm, st I'm actually just as strong, if not stronger. But I can't shoulder press the 150s anymore. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Because I have shoulder injuries that I obviously haven't taken mm -hmm. care of. Mm -hmm. So like I'll go to press the 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. And dude, I get the craziest pinches inside my shoulder. Doesn't hurt when I do anything else. Mm -hmm. When I roll, when I frame, no problem. Yep. But the second I do 90 pounds and up on the shoulder, just sitting you know, vertically and, and pressing pain so it's like i have to be cognizant of these things but guess what tell me you still got up and you shoulder pressed I shoulder Mi press, and man. millions of people wake up every day and they don't even touch 20 pounds i shoulder press man that's what i every time every day i go to the gym no matter whether i go heavy i go light i run fast i run slow i'll do a mile i might run a mile in seven and change i might run a mile in nine and change i might run a mile in ten and change depends on how my body's reacting that day yeah. but guess what i still did a mile i'm excited how many other people didn't do a mile i'm excited for it to get Warm again. Oh, it was warm I love for, running outside. We got cock teased, bro. It was warm for like a, yeah. a couple of weeks, and then yeah. all of a sudden, the ass crack of winter just came back and just said, hey, I'm still here. Well, you know what? I, and I, this might be the military in me, I love cold running. Now, get out. I yeah. this fucking guy out of my I haven't office. I haven't I haven't done in much this year. Um and that's kind of on my fault because I've just been I guess spoiled the running inside. But I wanna say maybe like a month, month and a half ago, I woke up and I put all this stuff on and my girlfriend was like, Where are you going? And I was like, I'm going to run. And it was oh. like it was like thirty five degrees no. out. And and I was I was I, I would I was at a time at that time and I do want to bring this back. This is completely my fault, but I was doing a five K a week. So one day I would wake up and it was like my I guess I'm psychotic enough to call it an active rest day. My active rest day was doing a 5K. And I How okay, so I I I can agree with that. You're yeah. a job first off. Yeah. Second off though, but how was the run? Was I, it was it a was it a very intense run? Was it something that you were pounding through or was it something that you were just doing and it didn't matter how much time it took you, you were just getting it done? It depended on the day. Okay. Because Cuz I can agree with you when when you say it's an active recovery day if you were going light and just yeah. cozying about and just you were just getting the miles on the shoes. Some days I would go at like a jogging pace. You know, I had like the Under Armour running app and I would like see my pace and how I'm doing. Some days were 10 something each, you know, whatever. But then like if I felt good, then I would try to, and I'm, you know, as you know, with a lot of running people, you try to go for negative splits. So I might start at a jog and then my second mile will be faster and then my third mile will be faster. Other days... I might start fast and then I'll just gradually get slower. I don't know. I would kind of try. Like, I, there was no really method to my madness. For me, it was like, I just want to get a 5K done. And, and a 5K is what, like three and a half, three? Uh, 3.1. Okay. Yeah, three. Yeah, 3.1. Um, I do, uh, especially when it's nice. I mean, now it's been different with my work schedule, but like last year I was doing like a ton of charity 5Ks, you know, so they do the Lieutenant Mike Murphy 5K in the summer. Um, I was I do that every year. I, that's the one 5K I try to hammer in. Um, I did like the hot pock fire department 5k. I did like a cancer 5k. Like I'm all about just giving to charity and using fitness as like a charity tool, donating, doing what I can. And everyone's different. And I get that. But like, 
I just enjoyed showing up, putting in miles to test myself, but also donating to a good charity. And, you know, for, I, I, I even did one, I think I did one for like teachers once for like an education foundation, you know, for, 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 for the, for, uh, for, uh, scholarships for the underprivileged kids. So like doing, donating for that, donating for this, you know, like if it's for a good cause, I, I'm, I'm probably in more than anything. Yeah. Um, so when the weather gets nice, yeah, no, I, listen, I, I'll thrive on running and stuff like this, but there is nothing, I guess for me, cause I'm psycho more peaceful than like 35 degrees outside with a beanie and a long sleeve on and just going, Ugh. you know, I'll start, I'll, don't get me wrong. I'll be freezing. But then like once, once I warm up, like, you know, like, uh, and I can get my stride going Yeah. now I won't run as fast because the cold air, you know, it, you know, cold air, you know, but that's the good Your training. Lungs. Yeah. So like, I can't like, if I'm pushing like, you know, eight, eight, like eight minute miles, I won't be able to do that in, in, in freezing cold. I can do, you know, I, I'll try to keep it at nine something or else I'll gas out and I'll be like heaving, you know? But um, I, like, I like running super hot. Yeah, with the super hot weather. Oh yeah, some people won't run super hot. Harps off. Yeah. <laughs> you go to Jones Beach. You go to Jones Beach shirtless with just a pair of shorts on, and you just go. Dude, I just so. I, love it. I go from here. I go from my apartment all the way up to to the top of Huntington, all yeah. the way down the harbor. Yeah. So all the boats in the summertime, and you're yeah. on the harbor road. Everyone's at the beach and shit like that, and you're just fucking going, and you just got music on, and you're just chilling. I just try when I do run. I try to avoid like heavily like like big streets with a lot of cars, you know, because like, you don't want to constantly you want to stop, look at both crosswalks, and keep going. You know, so like when I do run, like I know my area enough when I do run, I try to stay in like the back streets and it's like, it may not be like a good view, but I at least don't have to break my stride and wait for like a red light, green light, this, that, mm -hmm. the whole nine, you know, cause that's what pisses me off more than anything is when like when I lose my stride and like I... You know, and I'm like, oh, now I got to pause it. Then, then I have to go on my phone, pause it, and then and then hit yeah. start. But then, like, I'm taking rest, and I try not to account rest into it unless I'm trying to be like, all right, I'm going to run a mile, wait a minute, and then run another mile, this and that, the whole nine. So it's just, there's no method to my madness, you know? It just depends on the day. I don't wake up and say, oh, I'm going to do sub eight, or I'm going to do sub nine. I just... Just do your damn thing. Hey, I woke up and I ran three miles, and that's what matters to that's me. It, bro. You know, that's it. I could do it in thirty minutes. I could do it in sixty minutes. I, I still woke to, up and did it. I may have to hit jits again tonight. No, you're do it. Get, you know, get me get me jazzed up. Man. Yeah, listen, listen. Move, movement is a blessing, man. There's people that are missing arms. There are people that are missing legs. There are people that don't believe in fitness. And moving your body is a gift. It don't matter if it's it's a six minute mile or thirty minute mile. You still got up and did it. Facts. And like I said, those Navy SEALs and those dudes, they wake up and they say that a twenty minute walk is the most important part of your day. Yeah. And these are dudes who uh, have dude, done oh, bad things. Truthfully, you know? that's why I'm I'm so blessed with Kenji because he. Not he forces me to go outside and walk him because I don't have a yard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we are forced to like walk around. And don't get me wrong. Sometimes I cheap out on the walk. Oh yeah, it's too fucking cold. And I go, bro, I know you're built for this weather. I am not. Yeah. Even yeah, if yeah. I'm bundled up and just the wind's hitting you. Of course, of course. We're going back to the house. But once it starts getting nicer, which it was for a couple of weeks, I mean, I walk all the way up to Prime with him. We do a nice two and a half, three mile just walk, and yeah. he's gassed by the end of it. He's really not built for that. Of course. Of I tried running with him a few yeah, times. Yeah, he's like, he's not he's having like, he's it. Like, I'm yeah. not a Malinois, bro. What the fuck? Yeah, like, he, my bones are a little bigger and heavier than this. He's not having it. But it's it, it's nice because we get to like walk around, see things, you get the fresh air, this and that. And then, you know, obviously you've you've heard my spiel on the two phone mm -hmm. system now and this and that. And I'm trying to just one for pain, one for pain, one for pleasure. Exactly. <laughs> this is just for business and normal day. And then I turn this off at night and then I'm just on the other one full time. But yep. now my close friends that have the number and my family, mm -hmm. they're starting to just hit me up on the personal line, which my mom at first was just like I don't know which one to hit you up on. And now yeah. she just hits me up on both. And yeah. if I don't answer on one, she calls me on the other. So now she's got two means. Nikki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nikki, what the fuck? So everything is, uh, everything's good, dude. Yeah. Uh, now nah, listen, it's, uh, every, every, you know, and, and I'll say one more thing and this is going to be kind of upsetting, but it's just kind of something I want to get out into the world because <sighs> so I lost my mom last year and it was an unfortunate battle with complications of a stroke. And while I was sad and upset, what put, my life into perspective was that there was a woman who was in the room next to my mom and she was coming down from cancer. She went terminal, had six months to live. She had a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And while I was upset because I think I'm decently young and I didn't deserve to lose my mom, knowing that I had 30 years with my mom to make memories and enjoy the time that I did have, this one-year-old is not going to remember his mother. This four-year-old, if he's lucky, he's going to remember her. Yeah. And, you know, when she passed, everyone felt bad. I, you know, I'm human. I'm allowed to be sad and everything. But the one thing that I emphasize more than anything, and especially on this 
on, on, on this podcast was life in perspective. You know, like you're allowed to be sad and you're allowed to have feelings, but there's always someone out there that has it worse than you, you know? And another quote that I've always lived my life by is that the world does not feel sorry for me. Therefore, I will not feel sorry for myself. Whenever I was training hard and I got injured and I had to sit out, or if I was doing like a fitness test and I didn't get the numbers that I wanted, you know, and that kind of really hammered home when I lost my mother because I thought about everything going on in the Middle East and how many mothers and kids, you know, are are losing their lives every day out there. How many kids are losing their parents to cancer and all these other unfortunate things at such a young age. So, you know, I had... 30 years with her and a lot of people can't say that they have 30 years with their parents and you know I just you know I hope that you know perspective and just all of that I talked about before is that life is not just a little bubble there is so much more to life and everything that's going on around you and people kind of need to be aware of that you know like after I lost my mom I was back at work like a week later you know was I upset of course I was but guess what I had I got stuff to do, you know, like I, I, the world does not feel sorry for me losing my mom. Therefore I will not feel sorry for myself, you know? So when you're down, like Rocky said, it's just about picking yourself up and, and going back to it, you know, right back to it, you know, and getting, and getting, getting back to it. You know, you can't sit there and, and, and wait for, and wait for the world to come pick you up. Only you are responsible for picking yourself up. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So just, it's, it's all about wide perspective, man. There's always people that are going to have it better than you. It's healthy to strive for a better life. It is not healthy to feel bad for yourself of the people that have it worse than you, yeah. you know, in everything. Then it's just everything. So when, um, when Kenji started having seizures mm. and he had, ep- and he formed epilepsy, uh, it was a very devastating thing to me because I painted the perfect picture of a dog in my head of like how amazing he is and how he, how amazing he's going to be and mm-hmm. how I won't have to deal with health problems until later in life for him and it it was very difficult for me in the beginning, especially because I painted this perfect picture of him on social mm-hmm. and in life and all these things. And then on the side, we're dealing with seizures and, you know, you're you're sitting there crushed every time that one happens. Mm-hmm. And I and I don't remember exactly who had said it to me, but somebody had said uh, he doesn't even know he doesn't feel bad for himself. He has no idea that it's happening. He just mm-hmm. knows that he loves you and you're his guy and this and that. And I've had to gr- I've had to battle with the thought process of did I cause this? Was it something maybe he hit his head or a pill that I the the uh, tick and flea that I gave him because they're known to cause neurological issues. And I battled with myself for a long time thinking that this was my fault in some capacity, and it was a very hard battle. And until I started realizing that. Number one, there's a couple of things. Number one, that whether he lives two years, a year, six months, 10 years, 15 years, you got to just keep living and having fun with him. Yep. Unfortunately, when shit happens, you just got to deal with it and then get right back to normal life. Exactly. And then on top of it, one of the other puppies from the litter, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I got a note, a message from the breeder. They mm-hmm. just started having seizures. So it runs in his line. Exactly. So as I've come to terms mentally with it, it seems like it's spearheaded in like a closure type of a way of like, you didn't cause this. It's just in his line. Yeah. And then it brings you back to the perspective of just keep doing what you're doing with him. Yep. You know, just keep living, keep having fun, keep doing things. It doesn't mean that he's not perfect because he is. He's perfect in his own way. We all, we all got to deal with shit. There's other dogs that have seizures and they die a week later. So exactly. The fact that he's four and he's, he's been having them since he was two on and off, that's two extra years that other people didn't get with their dogs. See? And, 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 and it's tough to even, it, it's tough to agree with, you know, try to like bargain with yourself and say, yo, it's cool, bro. Like you have to just realize that it's not, Exactly. You're painting the picture. It's it's actually a, a brighter picture. Just focus yeah. on that. You know, what what you have is what's in front of you. Yeah. You know, that's and that's kind of it goes with what we were we talk about like injuries, right? Like I may not feel like I'm capable of doing, you know, something pedal to the metal at full speed without hurting myself, but like I still, you know, would wake up or go to the gym and modify my workouts to where I don't hurt myself. And I, I go to the gym six days a week now. I go to an export mass pequa, but like I do a certain program where I know is healthy for me and it's not gonna hurt me. You know, like I, I take out heavy hinging movements and 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 I do a lot of machines because machines have a lot of back support and and this and that, you know. So that's what I'm focusing on right now. And then when I'm healthier, I'll get back to, you know, going, you know, full speed again. But it's like getting injured, what am I gonna sit sit at home and do nothing? The world doesn't feel sorry for me. Oh, I I, I have a I have a you know I have a 
shoulder injury or I have a leg injury, guess what? There's people missing legs. There's people missing arms. Yeah. You know, life is perspective. You know, I don't really, I don't speak to my dad anymore. I cut that relationship off. Pretty, Sorry to hear. It's okay. It happens, man. Uh, but I, but he had MS or mm. has MS, mm. and uh, you know, he just progressively got worse as I was getting older. So. You know, you you go from seeing your dad struggle to walk in general to using his hands in the car to, mm. like, move his legs to the gas pedal and to the brake pedal to then years, years later being fully in a wheelchair. You know, a lot of the stuff that I that I do, especially the double training sessions and this and that, even though I'm sore and I'm beaten down and I'm tired and I know I need a rest day, sometimes even though, like I said, we don't speak, I still think of that situation where he can't work out at all. He does PT, but it's... I mean, mm-hmm. the PT is trying to stand without the support of his chair or crutches or anything like that for more than 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. So that's his version of oh, yeah. working out. And, you know, I never want to take that for granted. So if I can train and I can do my thing and I can get out there and roll and give other people a tough challenge and work out and do all these different things. Movement is a gift. Yeah, then, it, <laughs> then it's a win. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's that's pretty much it. Zachy yeah. Guns, you're fucking awesome, bro. Hey, listen, man, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I want to thank you for having me. I know this was a long time coming since uh, a couple months back so i'm happy to be here uh well worth the wait uh, uh yeah you well know I, I'm, I, right I'm 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 not uh, an influencer or instagram famous by any means i do have the drum page if, right. any, if there's any musicians out there that that want to talk drums or just talk life i'm i'm, I'm out here so well, i want you to give everybody so. the plugs but however i just want to say that i just i never no matter how large or stag whatever it might be no matter how big or small this podcast winds up being in the long run yeah i'd never need or want famous people i don't fucking care exactly I don't care how many pe- how many followers because i guarantee you that out of most of the influencers that i know you have more substance to you than wow. any of that no dead serious <laughs> no dead serious thanks man i appreciate you have more it. substance to you than a lot of these other people and i that's really what this is about it's about substance yeah it's about people that actually have gone through shit have experienced things and have taken life by the fucking the bull by the horns i've like taken life by the horns and that's really something that the common person and the person that that has the trials on a daily basis oh yeah that's what we go through i appreciate you man yeah no it's i don't, it's, I don't need some chick with a, nah, yeah. BBL and a million followers coming through and talking about how the surgery changed her life nah. and she got a million followers i don't give a fuck about that person like enjoy your million followers. yeah i want the real people no nah, it's it's you know every person in life has has different perspective and i guess i'm just here to talk about mine you know so yeah. <laughs> been through some shit man yeah You're no right. it's, and it's, the navy helped you see the world yeah you know that's what 20 countries hopefully 20 more we'll see I love that too. So appreciate Please give, you, man. Give, give the drum plug if anybody wants. Oh to connect yeah, with well, you so the one thing I didn't really talk about is you know the expensive hobbies of the world besides uh, besides shooting. You know, I'm I'm definitely a decent shooter. You know, if there's anyone that wants to talk about getting into firearms training, I'm not an expert by any means, but again, I, I think I know a little bit more than the common man. So you know, I'll talk about that. I'm a musician as well. Uh, I'm trying to get a couple gigs with my. Uh, I have a cover band in the works right now. We're trying to just get out there and play Green Day and Blink 182 and all the songs that people love. I just want to, you know, I grew up playing drums. It was it was a great time. I'm trying to get back to that now. So um, you know, I'm, my Instagram will probably be posted here. Zachy Guns, if you ever want to talk. Zachy Drums is the drum page. I post <laughs> I post some covers on there with just uh, with just my GoPro. I'm working on some recording equipment, but uh, for now, I'm just a guy that's happy with a camera that just wants to play and have fun. But I'm always good for conversation and talking about life outside the bubble, which is kind of which yep. the main topic of what this was, was life outside the bubble. So if anyone wants to talk about anything like that or is interested, or if people are thinking about the younger guys out there, if you're thinking about joining the military, I think I can give you some perspective on that as well about the pros and cons of everything that happens. Um, but thank you, brother. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, dude. So, um, this is episode 92. 92. 92 with Zachy Guns slash Zachy Drum. That's, <laughs> that's my fucking man. I got to tell you, you, you should, you'd probably, I'll tell you this after we cut off, you'll... Uh, this is probably something that you'd like for the recording. Oh, okay. And stuff like that. Okay. But uh, on that note, I appreciate everybody for listening to the episode. Please share, comment, like, subscribe, do all the, you know, that's the call to action. Do all of the things <laughs> that help this channel grow so I can continue sitting down with amazing humans like Zach. And uh, definitely reach out if you're interested in the military, Second Amendment stuff, whatever yeah. you might be, feel. He's a down-to-earth human being, as you can tell for, you know, two hours of us sitting down to each yeah. other. That's, <laughs> you, you, you got the... The third person sitting down listening yeah. in our conversation. That's really what it was about. So appreciate uh, you, brother. I appreciate you and I appreciate all y'all for fucking with us. But for now, peace. Yeah, peace.